again, everybody, and welcome to the Jim Cornette Experience, where we cover the fights, the brawls, the pull-aparts, the chaos, and the controversy in pro wrestling, and every once in a while, we even talk about the matches. And to join me on another one of these legendary podcasts, my co-host and cohort, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, he's podcasting's premier prognosticator, the great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again, and I'm very happy to announce I've signed a five-year extension with Arcadian Vanguard. I will continue to do whatever I want. And, and you'll continue to do whatever it is you do do. But you know, you do that voodoo that you do so well. And, you, and you, you've been calling things. You are the premier prognosticator because you've been calling a lot of things. And we see the, we see the pieces falling into place. Actually, all the pieces are falling apart. That's why we see them falling into place, because we predicted they would they would fall apart at some point. But you big dummy, I'm going to slap your face. What what happened was you were late, Brian Last, on making the intercontinental connection here so we could do this program. You were two minutes late. And by the way, I've suggested to Grizzly Smith that you be fine for that. But... I suggest I Grizzly Smith is shot in the face, so well, I think I'll be oh, off scot-free. I was making a Bill Watts joke, and I wasn't going for the goddamn, the other direction that you seem to go. I know, but, but I still any- like to talk about the death of perverts. Well, <laughs> that, that, that should be a series on Vice. Maybe since I'm their biggest television star these days, me and old Action Jackson or Action Bronson or whatever, I'll suggest that. But anyway. You and Action Bronson hunt perverts. And kill them. It would be the highest rated show on cable TV. Oh, well, wait a minute. He kills them. I cut the promo on them first. Let's let everybody play to their strengths. Do you watch or do you leave the room? To, to what, what? If he's going to handle it and you're just going to cut the promo, are you going to watch what he does or are you going to walk out of the room? Well, if it's a goddamn television show, somebody's going to watch it eventually. Why would I? Oh, I can't see what's going to be on TV here. I'll just leave. No, I'll do what we did to the guy in Beckley. I'll stand there and cuss him out and then fucking Stan will punch you. Anyway, so what I was trying to say was that since you were two minutes late getting on the connection here, I went to Twitter and immediately saw an Ernie Ladd promo with Reeser Bowden from 1978, Leroy McGurk Television, about Andre the Giant. And there's Ernie, Andre the Dummy, I'm going to slap your face In the general public, I will slap your face in front of your parents, Andre the Dummy, if you call me a liar saying that I have not beaten you numerous of times. And the voice alone, he sounds like James Earl Jones. What happened to men's voices? They they, they, they have gone the way of James Earl Jones. You know where that footage comes from? It comes from Leroy McGurk's Tri-States Wrestling. The reason it's out there. Tell me the origination of that footage. That's from the two-inch stuff Bill Watts gave me. But there you go. So you've been hiding this, and I had to see it on. I had to see it on Twitter. You all along have been hiding this footage from me, and I had to see it on Twitter. I have more one-inch and two-inch stuff than the average bear. That's what she said. (laughs) (laughs) Very good. Very well done. Oh. Oh, nobody's going to serve me up one like that uh, the rest of today. Uh, but I'll tell you what I did get served up here just a couple of days ago. And I've got to thank the folks at Emo's Pizza because they contacted me a, a few days ago and said they wanted to send me something. And they sent me a box not only of frozen Emo's pizzas, I got the, I got a, 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 the four meat. Got the pepperoni. There's one with with the deluxe. There's bacon, but also a beautiful gift box. And it's not just prepared for me. Apparently, they have these ready, and I believe they are selling them. Uh, of the pizza sauce and the uh, creamy garlic dipping sauce, the, the marinade, and some of the uh, uh, salad dressing, and just boy howdy! I couldn't wait. The first night I got it, I had the uh, the four meat. And I actually had some extra Provel cheese already in the refrigerator that I sprinkled on top of it for just such an occasion. But I want to thank the folks at Emo's. Apparently, 
And I saw this, and we've been so busy the past couple of weeks. I didn't jot it down and investigate further. But I saw somebody sent me a clip that the emos is now going to be available. They're they're branching out, not the uh, the actual brick and mortar locations, as they say, but they're going to be available in grocery stores. I don't know if this is regionally or nationally, or what's going on. But you, the frozen pizzas, the Provel cheese, all of their fine dressings and bottled condiment items. So. They didn't send me any publicity on this. So I'm making this up off the top of my head and I'm not getting paid for it. Neither are you. That's why you're silent over there, Brian. But no, I'm thanking them. It was very nice of them to send me that. And I would suggest if anybody wants to know where or if they are uh, going to be available to purchase this stuff in grocery stores, uh, their Twitter is at emos pizza and it's i m o s some people think they're emos like the the uh what was that emo kind of an offshoot of goth yeah emo film <laughs> or the emo you know fucking kids and the goth kids and they they have uh contests to see who can be more depressed or whatever but it ask uh, or at emos pizza i m o s is their twitter just Tweet them and say, hey, where can we get this shit? And Cornette told us it was available. Don't lie to us. Come up with the information and make it quick. And what day is Emo Phillips in the store? I want an autograph. Yes, he's going to be. Actually, you know that after he got out of show business and starting this pizza chain, it really worked out for him. I never understood the haircut. He looked more <laughs> like Mo Howard. I don't know. Um, speaking of uh, the, the Stooges, my Stooges, the Feather Bottoms, all three of them, Hotchkiss and Fanny and Felcher are hard at work, uh, filling the merchandise orders, the action figure orders that are flying now out, out of the Feather Bottoms trailer and into the hands of the Cult of Cornet members. Um, I've lost track where we're at, folks, to be quite honest with you, but the First round of mailings has started to arrive. People are tweeting pictures of the figures and et cetera. So it can happen to you. It's already happening to, uh, I think we probably served the first 400 customers, which means we're still, <laughs> we're still battling up that hill or down the hill or across the valley. I don't know, hither and yon, but there's no waiting on non-figure orders like 14 days from start to finish at max. And the figures I'm continuing to sign and box and hand off to the Feather Bottoms as quickly as possible. And I believe that almost, I would say all but 20 of the raw pink and red variant figures that were sold in the mass chaos on September 17th have already been signed and are on the way. And then we're working on the two packs, the people who ordered one of each. And those are coming up uh, to be done this week. Anyway, jimcornad.com. I can't say that we will fill a figure order quickly if you order it today, but guess what? It's going to be even longer if you wait till next week. So get in your place in line right now because everybody will have everything by Christmas if if they hurry and don't let me down. If you want it, get the order in. Bam. Santa will, Santa Corny is going to come down your chimney, even, maybe even by Halloween or Thanksgiving this year. Well, it's your show. Well, hey, you, you, you can, well, just, just goddamn pawn off all the work on me. Why don't you? For heaven's sake, say so. Just speak. speak now you know so how it feels. Know, Hello, so ladies the and gentlemen. People know your, your voice. I'm over here now. I'm over here now. <laughs> oh, you tickle me. I, that was a South. You don't watch South Park, so I can't even bring that up. But, but what we're all watching is Tales from the Territories on Vice TV this coming Tuesday night uh, when at 10 p.m. Eastern when Andy Kaufman's Adventures in Pro Wrestling will be uh, discussed and gone over by the all-star panel of Jerry Jarrett, Dutch Mantel, Jerry Lawler, Jimmy Hart, and uh, Jeff Jarrett rounding it out on Tales from the Territories this Tuesday night on Vice TV. I will be coming up in the, in the weeks to come, folks. Remember, it's a 
episode season, and they've only done one or aired one this this year. So we got nine weeks to go, and I'll be there eventually. But in the meantime, enjoy some of my photography and or video clips that I have provided the fine folks there on the uh, Memphis wrestling episodes. Anyway, we got, hold on here. Oh, and, well, I don't know whether this is in order. I was going to say the next week they're going to do something, but I've got all the uh, the topics, but I don't have the order. AWA, Stampede, Florida, Crockett, Portland, Polynesian, Pacific Pro. There's some alliteration for you. World Class in Dallas and Mid-South Wrestling is the lineup this season. I'm not sure of what order. All right, Brian, we have mail. Mail from the Cult of Cornette members. All right. I always love this segment. Well, give it a full-throated endorsement, why don't you? Are you saying that you don't like to hear from the people? Are you turning heel on us the here? The actual words out of my mouth were, I love this segment. <laughs> How dare you accuse it, me of anything was, different? It was the inflection. The inflection no. in your tone. Don't take that tone with me. I'm, don't make me change my tone. I'm really looking yeah, forward to this. Yeah, big dummy. I think this is going to be great. All righty. Uh, it's from our friend Cat Jactus in BFE, Oklahoma. Dear great Brian Last and greater Jim Cornette, I don't know if you guys realize this, but you are doing a disservice to the hard work and effort actual cosplayers put into their craft by calling shitty wannabe wrestlers cosplay wrestlers. Because these people look nothing like wrestlers, whereas the whole point of a cosplayer is to be as accurate as possible. Look at all the Deadpool cosplays, true-to-life video game characters, cartoon characters. I saw an ED-209 from RoboCop once. What is that? Brian, do you have any idea? I mean, I love RoboCop. I think that must be the big giant thing that uh, shot up the guy in the... Conference room, if I had to guess. The giant thing. Okay, I've seen a guy on YouTube who made a life-size Thanos cosplay, for fuck's sake. And these wannabe wrestlers won't even wear a padded jumpsuit to at least make themselves look like they have muscles like a wrestler would. This is a good point. I think he's got a point here. He well, goes on. Oh, go ahead. He has a point in terms of, I guess, maybe the elite cosplayers. But there are also people who dress in pathetic costumes and show up looking like shit, but it's their best. And that's still cosplay. Well, but then there are people who show up and wrestle and it's the shits, but it's their best. So see, maybe we're insulting. I don't know whether we're insulting some wrestlers by comparing them to cosplayers or insulting some cosplayers by comparing them to some wrestlers. But he goes on to say, I'm no cosplayer myself. I merely admire the craft. And I know you guys wouldn't want to insult the fine cosplayers out there. Now, see, there's a, there's a, a, a mitigating statement by lumping these cosplay wrestlers in with them. So maybe the deal is we just don't like outlaw mud show wrestlers and or outlaw mud show cosplayers. If you're going to be if you're going to be professional about your amateurishness, then we don't have a problem with you. Well, I guess there's a difference between originality and amateurness and people who are cosplay, you know, the Young Bucks at different times, cosplay rockers, cosplay DX, cosplay NWO, whatever they saw on video they were trying to copy. That's cosplay. But someone who shows up and just is awful on a whole new level, but it's unique, that's not cosplay. Well, no, you got to actually be playing somebody. You can't just come up with your own costume and that's cosplay because you're not playing anybody. You're making your own shit up. But by the same point, one could make the claim that when the Cucamonga kids get in the ring, just the fact that they're wearing tights and wrestling boots and presenting themselves as pro wrestlers is, is cosplaying because... They actually aren't. Can you cosplay as an executive? Well, Laurenitis did a great job. <laughs> of this I wonder who you were going to go to. There it is. <laughs> I mean, he, you know, what, what was the statement somebody made in Hollywood one time? A limousine pulled up and an empty suit stepped out. 
That was Laurinaitis. He looked great. He dressed the part every single time that you saw him. He was dressed like he was somebody important in an office somewhere. Very good at that. Anyway, number two. I got email number two here, Brian. And this is from Andrew. And we we talked about uh, Tony Khan and uh, on one of the episodes, which he quotes here, and, and this was the discussion he was referring to. Actually, hello, Jim. And Brian, I guess you're implied. I guess. I was... I was listening to your thoughts on Tony Khan on episode 263, and you mentioned how you don't know why Tony Khan would not hand off booking duties to someone else. And I have a theory. Tony Khan created AEW to book wrestling. He never created AEW to make money. He's already filthy rich. Tony Khan created AEW because his lifelong dream was to book wrestling. He is a billionaire. And AEW is his toy, the same way a regular Joe would create a fantasy league team, etc. Tony Khan is doing the same thing, but because of his wealth, he can do it on a grander scale. He is not going to hand off AEW booking to anyone else, because then what is the point of him owning a wrestling company if he doesn't get to book it? That's right. That's right. He created AEW to play wrestling booker. The moment it stops being fun for him is when he'll hand off the bookings. And uh, the average fan on the street, well, I don't know if Andrew's a streetwalker, but he's <laughs> the average fan out in the wild, out in public, in their native habitat, and he sees it. And you're, and you're telling me that all these wrestlers who are getting a check from Tony Khan can't see it when the fans can see it, but they can't say it. But they will go, oh, Tony is a wonderful friend and booker and confidant. Well, and- look, I think the point of that email is something I've been saying, too. And for good or for bad, and it's not for good or for bad about Tony, just the fact it was created to be Tony's plaything. That's the only reason it exists. It wouldn't have existed. It wouldn't have been like, you know what? I think wrestling is a profitable enterprise. I want to go into it. Let's create a wrestling portfolio and have someone run it. It was, I want to do this. I've always wanted to do this. I've been training my whole life to do this. I want to do this. That's the reality of what AEW is and why it exists. He, he's been training his whole life. Him, He's been training himself his whole life. Though. In that's his head, I'm, I'm saying what he's thinking, and that is that's, I've been again, training that, my that's, whole life. That's like if you go to a guy and say, hey, you want to be a porn star? And he says, oh, well, okay, I'm a virgin, but I've been jacking off all my life. Again, and and, and let's say he wanted to be benevolent as far as the wrestling industry in general. He felt like, yes, they're these poor put-upon wrestlers. They need a place to to go into work so they don't have to sell their soul to Vince or whatever. Then he still could have used his connections and his money to set it up and hire people that were experienced and knowledgeable to administer, even if he didn't want to make a profit, if he just wanted to do this purely in a benevolent enterprise for the wrestling business and all these hardworking wrestlers out there. But he didn't do that either. The only, you're, you're exactly right, you prognosticator, you. The only reason that he did this was so that he could finally be a booker it like he's been in his mind since he was a teenager <sighs> anyway and again for good or for bad because there are people who love aew for what it is and that's tony's vision but that's the reality of it and that's going to be the interesting thing the uh the other point that the email had what happens if we get to a point ever where tony I don't know if bored is the right word, but recognizing Burned out, cracked up, rubber room at the puzzle factory. Well, recognizing that he's burned out because they're going to have to drag him away from this. And I'm not saying anyone's going to do that, but that's what would it would take more than likely. It's his baby. It's his project. His hands are all over it from the music to the entire television show. It's all him. Does more interviews than any fucking promoter I've ever seen in my life. Every day there's another image of him talking to some random podcaster out there. It's all about him. 
That's why he's in the center of every press scrum. It's a Tony Khan project, and it's more than likely not going to go away, and I think that's why the goal for people should be for Tony to get better at this because he's not going to step down. I, there's no, all right, I've had enough. I'm handing over everything. Here's George Scott or whatever. There's nothing like that. <laughs> okay, well, this brings up an interesting thought. Let's say, Brian, last, you are a promising rookie wrestler. You've got tool size, ability, looks, you can talk. There's reason to believe that you could be somewhat of a star in this business, right? And you've got the choice of two places to go. And now it's the WWE who not only is not any longer being run by Vince McMahon who had driven a wedge in between the company and many of today's modern superstars because he was crazy and made L.A. Knight, Max Dupree, and all this other stuff that we've talked about. But the, he's not there anymore. Now it's Triple H, who's the wrestling guy, who was the NXT guy. But also, even if you don't want to go to work for Triple H, or even if you want to, but you're not just going to work for Triple H. You're going to work for Nick Khan, the big Hollywood wheeler dealer deal maker. You're going to work for a publicly traded company that's worth $5 billion that ain't going to go out of business. You're working for a company that has still international reach and, you know, uh, uh, broadcast platforms, whatever. They ain't going anywhere. Whether you become a star is still up in the air like it is with everybody. But that company is only going to be sold to a major media conglomerate in its future. It's not fucking folding up or limping along or going out of business or whatever. I think we can all acknowledge that, right? Right. On the other side, what happens if you sign with AEW and Tony Khan, who is still a young man, but from the looks of him, he's aging either physically or mentally from the last three years. He's more frazzled. He's more peripatetic and erratic. And even if Tony was the rock of stability if he gets hit by a bus if he has a stroke if he comes down with some type of illness or just mentally gets fried who takes over where does it go from there who's running this thing megan is megan gonna be the new booker her name is mega not megan it's not my fault her parents didn't know how to spell they spelt it or just right the name is mega or is she going to be the one to pick the new booker? Or who is, is there a plan in place? Has Tony Khan written out, if I get hit by a rainbow bread truck tomorrow, run over in the street, this is who should be in charge of everything. He did write that, but from what I understand, it looks like it's in Chris Jericho's handwriting. Well, see, there you go. And then there's going to be like the Howard Hughes will. You know, it's like... It, do, do, do the Mormons, are they in on this? Does Clifford Irving have a say in whatever the fuck, right? So that's the point I'm making. You've got now the chance to either go to work for a multi-billion dollar publicly traded company that is as stable as it can be in the world of wrestling, and Triple H is there, but even if something happens to him and he has a bad heart, there are multiple layers of people in place at every turn that can hop right in, as we've just seen. And meanwhile, over on the other side of the street, if anything happens, to, even if something doesn't happen to Tony, do you want to take a good look at him at the media scrum, folks, at 2 o'clock in the morning and say, well, I trust him with my life and career. But even if you do, what happens if something happens to him? Who's running it? Where do they go? Who steps in to write the show? Has this been clearly delineated ahead of time or is it now going to be a big fucking king of the hill party to see which of the evps or the uh the new mentor plumber moxley or scene stealer chris jericho or who get my god what the fuck right so are people starting to think about that it's a question i'm asking well, you asked me if I was the wrestler, what I would do. 
Yes, I did. Long ago, I asked you that, didn't I? So let's play with that for a second. If I was this wrestler, how old am I in this wrestler, in this Hypo, hypothetical well, in this hypothetical in this, hypocr- in this hypocritical <laughs> with, with chef crafted chef crafted recipes in the, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you're if you're an aspiring wrestler with some level of talent and you you're a couple of years either way of 25 years old do i have a head on my shoulders am i smart enough to recognize what to do i would hope so Okay. I would hope so. We're talking, we're not talking about what would stupid people do. Right. Okay. But hey, there aren't a lot of main eventers with a good head on their shoulders. So it's the reality of wrestling sometimes. Am I getting a similar offer from both sides? I, oh, God damn it. Now you're really going into detail. All right. Let's say that it is similar. It is within the range of reason. Both things are approximately equal. More than likely NXT to start or AEW. I'm guessing not just dark, more than likely the main roster. Here's the reality of it. You have to look at what you want and where it could happen. If you're looking to become a main eventer and make a lot of money, with AEW, if you're a wrestling fan who's a wrestler, you're going to have the greatest conversations with Tony before you sign. You're going to fall in love with him because you can geek out on wrestling and talk about stuff and he knows his shit. He's watched it all. He knows it. So you'll love the conversations with him. It'll open you up to the idea of going to AEW and working for someone like Tony. With WWE, you're not going to really get that kind of feel. With Triple H, it'll be a different thing altogether. With the idea that eventually you're going to get to Triple H, I don't know who you'll deal with first. There'll probably be layers of people before you get to Triple H sometimes. I see with WWE and looking at who are Triple H's guys from NXT that they're bringing up and looking at the stars that are there that are aging out, I would see a clear path to becoming a main eventer. If I had size and I could talk and I was smart and I could put up with a year and year and a half, two years of complete bullshit with the booking and everything, there's a path there to main eventing WrestleMania. With AEW, there's a path to making good money. You'll have an easier schedule. What's the expression? With chaos, there's opportunity. There is the chance to be a main eventer there. It would really depend on how I wanted to control my own destiny. If I wanted to make a bunch of money and I wasn't going to worry about the booking or anything, I just wanted the main event, I would go to WWE. If I wanted to be hyper-involved in everything, I would go to AEW. I'd probably be frustrated, but that's what I would do. Well, but here's the problem there, pal. The young aspiring prospects don't seem to be the ones to be able to get hyper involved. It, it, you already have to be some level of name to start calling some of your shots. Because we've seen Tony's notorious for not knowing how to start guys and not knowing how to not knowing how to present unfamiliar talent on television on a regular basis in an upward trajectory on a you know on the weekly television program to get them more over three months after they come into the company than they are the night they come into company so yeah the it almost it's almost like if you come in there and you're not some level of name. That's when you get thrown in the, they, they get over by accident and, and Tony doesn't know what to do with them. It's, it's the, the top guys that have some, you know, levels of input into what they're doing. But, but if I was a wrestler who wanted to be involved, with, they're already somebody, right? If I was a young wrestler, if I was like an MJF, if MJF was in WWE, he wouldn't have been able to be as creative as he's been in AEW. Right. Would you but agree if, with that? If, if MJF hadn't had the fucking buzz and the attention and the conversation about him that he did before he came to AEW, I bet you he wouldn't have had as much input as he's had from the start as well. So let me ask you a situation like this, and this is completely hypothetical. Wardlow's contract comes up. He's got equal money offered on both sides. What do you do? I can tell you in a heartbeat, Wardlow. You wouldn't like living in Connecticut, but you don't have to work in the office. You can live anywhere in the country you want and work for the WWE. And Wardlow's goal, especially with what's been done to him over the last three months, should be to get the fuck to the WWE as quickly as possible. 
He has the size. He has the look. He can talk enough now that he'll get better. And that is a tailor-made place for them to get him over if they were interested. And I don't know why they wouldn't be with his various attributes. And they would know more focused, uh, a, a more focused approach than bringing him out on television and the people going crazy for him and then him winning a program and then either hiding him or teaming him up with multiple other people or the other night they put him in a match with fucking Brian Cage who physically makes him look less impressive and is so rotten, which is we'll talk about that program here in a little while, just... It, it, diminishes the guy even when he's beating him. The people get up now for the power bombs, not as much as they were, but they're still up for those. They were goddamn molten for the power bombs three months ago. Now they still like them, but they're they're making the fans fucking trudge through goddamn high water to get to the power bombs with Wardlow. It, it, there's no focus. There's no plan. He's just been bouncing back and forth doing fuck all of shit. And that, I can't believe, if they want to get a guy over in the WWE, they'll get him over. As evidenced by some of the guys they want to get over, you can't fucking get away from them on their television. Or like the way Tony uses Wheeler Yuta and Daniel Garcia. Well, yes, you can't get away from them. Even no matter how hard you try. (laughs) Imagine if Wardlow got that push. Imagine if Wardlow was out there fucking kicking the shit out of ex-WWE world champions. Well, that was the email about Tony Khan. That went a while. That certainly was. Anyway, email number three, and this is about the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame. And I got this. I'm not going to give this guy's name, and Brian, you would know it, and you'll figure out who it is probably, but just publicly in front of a million people because he's telling the truth about some shit and some people. I don't know what trouble I might get him in, but I got this email. I've known this guy for decades he's exactly who he presents himself as in the email uh and everything he says i have no reason to doubt is completely true but this is some more um information on the texas hall of fame disaster as he puts it he says that Lori mcgee hurst is the woman who took it upon herself to try to preserve everything when johnny mantell and his partner in crime k the initial K, just the or the letter K, not the name K Y, but the letter K, is who this partner in crime is referred to, and I'm thinking that may be his wife, Mantell's wife. Anyway, when Mantell and his partner in crime K abandoned everything, first off, Tony Volano, who was the guy who was running the Hall of Fame up in New York, did everything by the book when this was in New York. He was tired and in his mid sixties when he decided to try to hand it over to someone else. He was assured by the board of directors of the people in Texas, which was comprised of local business people, reputable people, that Johnny Mantell would never have control and would be a figurehead president. That all went south very quickly, and Mantell and Kay, over the course of a couple of years, emptied the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame coffers of approximately $70,000 that Tony had turned over to him. When the money ran out, I guess they figured it wasn't worth it anymore, so they just abandoned everything. Thank God for Lori and a few other people that managed to get a lot of this stuff back to the original donors and a lot of other stuff sent to the new Hall of Fame in Albany, the IPWHF. Unfortunately, there were people who somehow had electronic cards that let them enter the building, and these people did steal some things. Uh, But without Lori's intervention the entire contents might have either been stolen or just trashed. A few stories about things that Brian mentioned on the podcast. The Mick Foley couch. I drove to Mick Foley's house on Long Island and picked it up and then eventually drove it to the Hall of Fame in Amsterdam, New York. As for the Fred Hornby research work, Fred passed away several years ago. That's important stuff. For those of you who don't know who Fred Hornby is, he did the Buddy Rogers record book. Yeah, I mean, probably the first one was in the late 70s, I would have to think, but he's one of the earliest yeah. wrestling historians. He was, I believe, in the garden for the riot in 57. Yes, 
And he had compiled, well, I'll let uh, this gentleman go on and tell it. Fred passed away several years ago and left me everything. His research work comprised of 49 oh, wow. bankers boxes, 49 bankers wow. boxes full of paperwork. I drove those from Fred's house on Long Island also up to the Hall of Fame in Amsterdam. I did not know at the time that in the future all of this would go to Texas or I never would have brought the research work up there. Thank God Tim Hornbaker took it upon himself to go there and preserve it before it wound up in the garbage. Uh, I must correct one thing that uh, y'all were talking about. A lot of the people from the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame in New York are not involved with the new IPWHF. Uh, only Dr. Bob Bryla, whose involvement was to write up the induction procedures and the rules and regulations. Other than that, no one else from the, I guess, the original Amsterdam group is involved with this new group. But anyway, otherwise, on a personal note, Lori was able to send back to me one of Boyd Pierce's outfits that I had donated. <laughs> and he says, I hope the Mick Foley couch ends up somewhere and does not get thrown out. Is this but from someone? Is, is this email from someone on Long Island? Um, goddamn, you know me and geography. I'm not okay. sure. He, I'll ask you off air. I'll ask you off. Well, I, he's he uh he sent me a million dollars one time. Is that a clue? <laughs> no, it's not a clue. I'll I'll tell you off air then. <laughs> <laughs> People are like, "What the fuck is going on there?" It's it. It'll mean something to you when I tell you. I got one more email. And this is from John Fell in Baltimore, who is not only a one of the OG members of the cult of Cornette back there uh, long ago, but also a very perceptive fellow who has written a very pithy email, full of pith. It's very pithy. It's full of pith and substance, and it's weighty. And it has has things to think about, right? And I wanted to read this. Um, JC, with every episode you record, I listen, learn, laugh, and talk to the radio in my car. I have so many things run through my head when you're reviewing the current wrestling shows. One that really hits me is why? Why does this thing that changes without changing still go on and on? We have a four-sided square ring and three ropes on each side. It sits in the middle of an arena, theater, or bar. Men and women perform simulated combat in front of a crowd. They fight for different reasons given to them by their creative staff. So that hasn't changed, but it really has. As you've pointed out numerous times, less people watch the shows and attend the events. There are so many reasons why. There are more options for entertainment. The way people watch content is completely different. The biggest problem is we don't believe. We are not invested in the performers. The companies today seem lost or stuck in their old ways. It is not like the creative behind these shows have their finger on the pulse of what good television is or should be. I asked this on Twitter. Can you name one superstar in the last 30 years that has not either worked in a territory, come from a family bloodline, or come through Ring of Honor or OVW? I pissed some people off on Twitter, but who would someone know today? Austin, The Rock, Michaels, Hart, Taker, Foley, Brock, Orton, Punk. What do they have in common? The three things above. So why does it exist? How long will it exist? Who is here to replace Roman and Brock? Where are the future stars? There's no territory to pull from. There's no Ring of Honor. There's no OVW. The bloodlines will dry up at one point. We see it now. The boom was over years ago, and when the 18 to 45 demo becomes 45 to 100, will there be an 18 to 45 behind it? We'll see. Who knows? You may get to retire sooner than later if the big two can't find a way to not only get eyes but make someone fall in love with their company and want to follow it 30 years from now. I'm not sure that will happen. John Fell. What do you think, Brian? Where, when you think about the number of genuine stars that have been made over the last 10 years, as opposed to the 10 years before that, the 10 years before that, the 10 years before that, where are we going? 
Is the the demo going to be in 15 years? Is it going to be people 65 to 70 that are right in the middle there where it was last good? And where the fuck are we going? It's scary to think about where we're going to get the next generation of wrestlers, and it's scary to think about how wrestling is going to attract young fans again. And <laughs> they keep saying, oh, well, to attract the young fans, we've got to be you know, the, we got to be the hip and with it bunch. And it's got to be all this chaos and all the dives because that's what the young people like and all the action and the furniture, because that's what the young people like. But uh, Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, but down through history from fucking hula hoop to the pet rock to whatever, just what young people like lasts three or four years, maybe sometimes. And then they go completely after something else. So is just getting a group of young people to like your shit without anybody from any other age group who thinks it may be stupid, silly, illogical, fake, phony, not worth my time, or poorly fucking acted, then isn't that a recipe for disaster? Aren't you kind of you know, appealing to an audience that you know by history and tradition and trend is going to go away fairly quickly? I think wrestling's making a lot of mistakes. <laughs> That's your question. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, if I do, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. I may have to send out a audition tape or I may have to get my resume together or, you know, what I'm going to do if, if wrestling goes away and I need to, to find a new line of work, Brian, I won't have anything to talk about anymore, I guess. Well, maybe, how am I going to support myself? I mean, the stock market, you know the stock market's sideways, right? It's up, it's down, it's all across. You can't trust it anymore. You can't trust stock markets anymore. And, you know, all the prices are up of everything, except your 401k. But you know who's making money, Brian? Who's just taking it in hand over fist. Who's that? Our friends at Masterworks. I mentioned this on your program the other day, that so far, they have had an average net return of 29% to their members that have invested in the fine art through Masterworks. Because as we, as we know, everything, collector plates, gold, Silver, precious metals, diamonds, everything goes up and down. But masterworks, I'm talking about the Shakespeare's and the Van Gogh's and the Rembrandt's and the people who really do the great stuff that stands the test of time down through the ages. When's the last time you heard of a discount sale on a Picasso? Huh? Oh, never. When's the last time you clearance? Got to get all these Rembrandt's out of here. I wish I'd be there. Prices slashed to the bat doesn't happen. And that's why the folks at Masterworks are helping people make money. Because, like I said, average net return of 29% so far on just six exits, as they say. That's, the, you know, that's in the trade. That's what they call it. And last month, they sold another painting and got a 33.1% return. And as we mentioned, everybody from me and Brian to Scott Steiner will tell you, that means that you've got a 33.1% chance. Oh, no, not this again of making some money with Masterworks. They've got an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau, and those things don't come cheap. They had to spend a fortune to bribe those people to give them that. There was no bribery. It was genuinely earned. That's true. They covered it up on the paperwork, and they can do the same thing for you, folks. You want the crooks working on your side. There are no crooks involved with Masterworks. That's right, folks. These crooks here are innocent. There are no Not crooks in... There are no crooks involved with Masterworks. Well, okay, you know. And they are innocent, and they're not art, crooks. They are. Art connoisseurs is what they are. They're art and innocent. These, these <laughs> they aren't art. They're, they're completely like babes in, in swaddling clothes. And these paintings that they buy that you get a piece of, and you have a stake in, in the appreciation value of them, and then the eventual sale, these paintings, you can barely tell where the cat burglar has cut them out of the frame in the gallery. They it's are amazing. Not... They use a sharp knife and just zip, zip, and it's right out of that frame. There is no stolen artwork 
or no artwork that was attained on the black market that is a part of anything that you'd be purchasing with Masterworks. It's all legitimate artwork that has been legitimately obtained, and there are no legal issues whatsoever. And in over 80% of the cases, the painting was actually painted by the person that signed it. Ladies and gentlemen... 100%, right let's, let's get away from the Steiner math, 100% of the artwork is legitimate. Yes, it's legitimately painted on canvas by people who purchased those paints. And folks, you again can be a part of this. You can own a piece of a piece of fine art, and when it sells, you can cash in and and you can, you know, if you move to the Philippines with 60 grand in cash, you can live like a king, from what I understand. But you can do anything you want to with this money. Just make sure it's in small bills when they hand it over to you. Folks, right now, so many of you have signed up. They want to offer my listeners priority access so you can skip the wait list and no waiting around. And I, that's the worst part about being involved with Masterworks is waiting around on the sidewalk outside of the museum where Masterworks people are going in and obtaining the art. Because you got to wait on a sidewalk and kind of look around and make sure nobody's coming. That's not how it works. You have to wait nowhere and no one is doing anything illegal or illicit. Of course, you just, in a legitimate fashion, purchase... I can't, I can't even speak. You're making me so mad. You purchase a piece of fine art, and what is better than that? What a great investment. Well, if you, again, purchase a piece of fine art, and then you can skip the wait list. You don't have to be waiting out on the sidewalk. All you got to do is use our link. Go to masterworks.art slash gym. That's masterworks.art slash gym. And you can find out all about what we're talking about, and, and you'll see that. Brian's, you know, sometimes misrepresenting things, but I try to straighten him out. And you can see important Regulation A disclosures at masterworks.com slash CD, because those disclosures, well, that's in case you have to hire an attorney over this situation, you may be, you may want to read through this just so you'll be prepared. Masterworks.art slash Jim. All right, well, I guess now it's time to talk about the graps. We're going to talk about the graps, everyone. That's the way they say it over there across the pond, Brian. Have you ever heard that? They call it the graps. I've heard that. Well, let's talk about the graps. Do you have, uh, a, and, do you have a preferred slang word for wrestling? Um, wrestling? <laughs> I don't know. What the, the, it, it all works. Well, it used to. Now nobody works. But it, we should tell the people how we're working. I just realized we're an hour into this program, and we haven't told people. What we're doing is we're recapping Wednesday and Friday on the show that we are— well, actually, it's all going to be the same show. Help me out, Brian. We're recapping Wednesday AEW and Friday SmackDown right now, and then we're going to take a break that the people will never know about while that the Arcadian Vanguard minions edit the rest of this program for release or escape, depending on your viewpoint. No minions, very talented people. Well, they're very talented minions. And, they're, and then we're going to come back early on Sunday morning, and we're going to talk about extreme rules. So by the time the people hear this, it will be seamless, but we're today on the program, Wednesday AEW, Friday SmackDown, Saturday Extreme Rules, and and then... After we finish with that, we'll jump out a window, right? That's right. Everyone's looking forward to finding out the White Rabbit is Vince McMahon. <laughs> I was, I, Wouldn't that be the greatest? Oh, come on. He takes off the rabbit head and it's Vince. <laughs> <laughs> I think you need to jump out the window. Hey. Um, you know, that, that was a I, I found this funny. Maybe some people wouldn't, but I won't mention any names. But about 35 years ago, my first wife came to me and said about one of the other boys and his significant other, did you hear so-and-so tried to throw his girlfriend off the balcony of their apartment? What a no-good son of a bitch. I said, but no, that's not, he's not a no-good son of a bitch. They live on the first floor. It was funny. It was funny to me. Did your wife find it funny? She didn't find it funny. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but they did. I've been, I'd been to their place. They lived on the first floor. So 
Anyway, um, AEW this past Wednesday night. Did what? Who? Who else got into it uh, in the back? Anybody by the time the show was over, or had they cleared that out when when uh, they pulled Sammy and Andre Oli Olio apart and and made Andre leave the building? The only other incident I heard about was there was a, a long, long, long talk between Chris Jericho and himself in the mirror. Well, but that's not unusual. No, not at all. Okay, so we'll talk about the television program now since nobody else got into a real fight. They led again with the best match on the program, and this not only was the best match on the program, they they can do it if they try. This was an example of what I was have been talking about all along is that smart workers, excellent workers, people who know what they're doing in this business, they work with people of different levels in a different fashion. And obviously, let's say this at the start, old Wheeler is not ready. And by the way, what the, if you have to pick a name, that's not his given Christian birth name. And if you had to pick a name to be a wrestler, why is Wheeler Yuta the name you'd pick? But besides that... <laughs> You know what Howard Baum said? Howard Baum said this, and I can't unsee it now, and it's so funny, but it's wrong. He called, we were, he was reviewing in the Mothership group, the Dynamite show, and he said, MJF versus normal superhuman. <laughs> and once you see it, you can't unsee it. <laughs> He's not ready for this spot on national television. I'm not even saying he never will be. Maybe I am, but definitely not now. We all know that. And for whatever reason, like Daniel Garcia, who's in the same boat, Tony has decided that these two, of all the people that he could have chosen to smash over like this, these two are, are what he's going to do. So they obviously instructed or wanted Utah to be, to be shined up by MJF in this match, but MJF had to be the one to put it together because it was completely different from almost any other AEW match you see. It made sense. There was a story to it. If you noticed MJF, and when I watched this match, I was tired because uh, there was a fiasco with the power and the DVR, and I watched this match after I'd seen the rest of the program, but I was tired. I didn't want to take notes. I just wanted to watch it because I was convinced I wasn't going to like it because I thought here's going to be you to kicking the shit out of MJF and whatever. And yes, they did shine you to. But if you noticed MJF, he built the thing. They want to see you to come off the top rope. So what does MJF do? He takes it away from the people and makes them wait for it. He's there. He rolls away when you to goes to the top. And that way the people don't get to see what they wanted to see. So they're mad at fucking MJF for taking it away from him. But when he finally hit it, then they exploded. And at the same time, MJF, he keeps attention on himself, the smart-ass facial expressions, the heelish things that he did. He put Yuta over and made Yuta competitive, but at no time was Yuta beating him within an inch of his life to where you could see desperation on his face that how in the world am I going to win this thing? You didn't see that because he didn't... A lot of it was mat wrestling where Yuta could get... Uh, false finishes out of it and two counts or he could duck under and surprise MJF the heel with his better wrestling because he's the baby face but it wasn't like if there was somebody wearing MJF out with a kendo stick or throwing him through furniture so this is how a top level main event star works with a middle card guy trying to help make him look better and still at the same time not making it look like that's the best that MJF can ever do, beating this guy by the skin of his teeth. Does that make any sense to you, Brian? It makes perfect sense, and I think you just described what was actually happening there. And that's why I thought it was the best example of a match of this kind that they've ever had on the program. 
And again, if it was I, it, out of anybody that might be ready for that spot, you you can you can see a few pick them. It would have been even better. But as it was, this was the best match start to finish that Yuta's ever had because he listened and it made sense, and they didn't do shit that was either preposterous or lacking in logic or it that would give you the impression that MJF is cooperating with his own demise or downfall. So by that it was a it was an excellent piece of business ending. Um obviously the finish was you know one of Tony Khan's finishes and it has to be screwy and there's people coming in and there's goddamn, you know, outside interfere whatever the fuck but mjf wins and that <laughs> that debacle didn't take place where mjf would actually do a job my god even they're they're that smart and they did a they did a great job with what they had with the conditions that prevailed and what they were working under this couldn't have been any better i didn't think so let mjf lay out everybody's matches and you'd have a stunning television program what do you think? Certainly the high point of the show. It's a good thing that this was also by far the most viewed segment <laughs> or segments. I guess it may have rolled into the second segment that AEW had because here's another thing we have to say before we even talk about the match because it's becoming more and more apparent and the ratings are starting to bear it out. MJF's now the biggest star in AEW. I know Moxley... And Jericho have been there for a while, and they're big stars. MJF is right now the right now he's already the biggest star in AEW. Well, let, let's break that down a minute because I may be able to say that better for you. Because I know what you're trying to say, but a lot of people are going, "Oh, Brian Last lost his mind. He's so he's on MJF's dick to the point where now he's saying he's a bigger star than Chris Jericho and John Michael." Blah blah blah. He is. Well, he's not necessarily a bigger star because a bigger star would indicate more people know him and he's a big major presence. And actually, because of Jericho having 20 years of television and Moxley being in the WWE and everything, they stay, may still be bigger stars. What you're talking about is right now in AEW, who do the people want to see more? Who do they want to watch? Who do they want to see on television? A more attractive star. Who's the next big star? And also, who does the network want? They recognize what's going on right now, too. Yeah, because you may like filet mignon. But filet mignon, you've been eating filet mignon for, well, I don't know. Maybe in, in Jericho's case, maybe we ought to talk about canned ham. But nevertheless, you've been eating that fucking steak for a long time. But along comes this delicious seafood dish. And you got to try, and MJF is the delicious new dish. He's still fresh. He's still always good. He still always gets a reaction. He's new. He's different. He's unique. He attracts attention wherever he goes because of that. And Moxley does same thing. And Moxley always does. And Jericho does same thing. Jericho always does. And even if you like it, you've seen it. So MJF may not be a bigger star. MJF may be the most important star, the most attractive star, the star the people want to look at right now and want to watch. And honestly, he's running away with it. And the, the, Punk's not on television to give him any competition in terms of the promos and the audience engagement. I don't know anybody in the company. Maybe Danielson is the guy who can put together matches that when he's allowed to and has an opponent that'll go along with it that make as much sense and are as exciting and logical and get everybody over and put everybody in the right place. But MJF's got a little bit of everything and nobody else has his package. Oh, see what I did there. And you know, you want to talk about MJF? He was in great shape here. Maybe the best shape we've ever seen him in, oh, in the yes. ring. Wheeler Yuta looks like he's on the way to take a Peloton class. <laughs> You know what I mean? So you're looking at the two of them standing there, and one of them looks like a wrestler. Even though he's not six foot five or anything, he looks like a wrestler. The other guy just, they're force feeding Wheeler Yuta. And there's a segment of the audience that likes it, 
And they've done everything. They put him with Moxley and Claudio and Regal. He's wrestling all these guys that are already established. While FTR and Wardlow were kind of buried, Garcia and Yuta became Tony Khan's biggest pet project. And he's, they're not giving up. Even though these guys can't pull ratings, unless they're in there with an MJF, because we've seen what happens when they're in there with Jericho, the ratings go down. But they're forcing these guys, and I think Yuta's all right. And I hope he fills out at some point. But they're pushing him way too hard for who he is and what he's going to mean to that company. I hope I'm wrong because they're not going to give up. I hope he ends up being just a phenomenal wrestler and establishes some real charisma. I hope I don't have to keep thinking of him as the normal superhuman now. But MJ, this match was all about MJF. And that goes into the second thing I wanted to say because you didn't really address it. What the fuck was the post-match? They're teasing the babyface MJF turn, which I think more than anything, this match pointed out what a mistake that would be. He's the only working heel they have there in the ring. They're going to make him a babyface? Why? Because Chris Jericho's trying to convince Tony that's the thing to do? So I don't like that post-match stuff where they're teasing MJF as a babyface, and then he runs from Regal. Well, MJF always backs down when it's face to face or the odds are even or whatever. I didn't have a problem with that. And also Regal's wearing brass knuckles and also Regal's tougher than everybody else on the roster. So I, you know, didn't have. Yeah, it took him 10 minutes to get into the ring. Well, <laughs> but at least he made it. Uh, but yes, and I agree. And I don't know what's going on with this. Oh, I didn't ask you to help me business with the blah, blah, blah. Um, it would have been, if they'd have gone for the handshake and fucking MJF would have shook his hand and kicked him in the balls, it'd been perfect. Perfect and get out. But nevertheless, here's another thing. And I've sat in on these meetings in the WWF. And I assure you, just because Vince is not there, they're still having these same kind of meetings. You know what Triple H is going to ask about prospective talent? Because they have their people, they're watching shows, and they, and they have the, Regal was a scout. And they have people in these positions where they watch everybody and everything, and blah, 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 see who fits their needs. But you know what they're going to say? They're going to look at that MJF. Look at him three years ago when the company went on the air. Look at him two years ago. Look at him now. He's put the work in in the gym. He's in the best shape of his life. He's gained size, so he looks legitimate, but he's not fat nor weighed down he's obviously his work has even though and they made a big deal of saying he hadn't wrestled in a in 129 days the fuck of but anyway the commentating it, not, is a whole nother problem that it's a well, disaster show wide show that, that, wide that really gets a guy over yeah he hadn't wrestled in four months but Again, the WWF or WWE, when they have meetings about talent, prospective talent, who's out there, who are they looking for, they look at that. Not only has his work improved, not only does his quarter hours get ratings, not only his his interviews at another level than almost everybody in the business except Heyman and a couple other people. He's transformed his body. He's grown up. He carries himself like a star. He is in and lives his gimmick. Those are all important things that in the WWE and in that, whether developmental system, training system, or just system system, they take note of. But meanwhile, here's the same guy that would be getting every kind of push in the world under the WWE umbrella by the basis of the parameters of what they look for in talent. And over on the other side, he hasn't wrestled on television in four months. And I know he was gone with the contract, Shmabada, but he's been back for how long now? What was it? Over a month. So anyway, I don't know what they're doing with the finish, but this was the shining moment of the show. And then honestly, as I mentioned, because I had a power failure and uh, all this other stuff this week, the next match was Darby Allen and Jay Lethal, and I would have loved to have seen it, but by the time that I it was I was able to view things, I was running late, but Darby Allen beat Jay Lethal. And now apparently Jay Lethal is mad or upset at his cohorts too. And they so did the hand and they did the handshake shit too at the end of this. Yeah. 
<laughs> so if you'll notice, there's a pattern developing where now they're going to do... I swear to God, it was the, the WWF program we said last week. They did the same finish in three matches in a row. Same basic deal. Now they're doing it on this show. But the next match on the program was a crime against nature. And I want to take just a second on this. Wardlow and Brian Cage. Old Brian Cage reappears. <sighs> I didn't even look at the match in terms of, you know, whether they did a good job or not. I look at the match in terms of why would you do this? Putting Bri Brian Cage looks like a freak of nature as, as a physical specimen. And he's so muscular and defined, but yet thick and powerful and blah, blah, blah that he's somebody that you look at. And remember when we first saw him, we said, boy, <clears throat> they might be able to do something with this guy. And we watched him work a couple times, said, okay, well, now we know why they can't. But to put him in the ring with Wardlow, it made Wardlow look like he's a piece of shit. Nobody's physique can compare with this fucking guy's, but he's the shits in the ring. He's robotic. He make his matches make no sense. He just wants to do moves. He's rotten. And so what they did was they matched Wardlow up with a guy who's bigger and more impressive physically, even if he's not taller. And at the same time, had a shitty match with him. Nobody cares about Brian Cage, the fans, the people, they don't give a shit. But he's kicking the shit out of Wardlow, and Wardlow's selling his ass off for him. So, this was a, and I mean, and I'm I'm pretty sure that I, he set the record for audibly, not audibly, but visually talking to his opponent on a television match in this thing, because all you saw was Cage's lips moving. So apparently, he was calling it. And somebody in there probably said, yeah, Cage has more experience. He's been wrestling longer than Wardlow. Let him call it. Fucking hell. So, again, Wardlow was up there with the people three months ago. And now they're just doing everything they can to neutralize his, you know, his best points. Hey, Goldberg being manhandled by a preliminary guy with a great physique is kind of what they just did here. So, and then, Cage superplexed Wardlow off the top rope. And I get Prince Nana. I like Nana. Prince Nana's there now, but he's with Brian Cage. And again, Wardlow was selling like Ricky Morton. Cage was getting multiple two counts. And then finally, just, when they decided they'd had enough, Wardlow just made his comeback and hit the four power bombs. That's all they want to see now is the power bombs. The match was brutal. And then, oh my God, as soon as he wins the match, here come two random fucking giant shaggy Samoans that we've never seen before. And they start getting heat on Wardlow and Samoa Joe hits to try to save but the numbers are still against them, and there's more heat. And then here comes FTR's music, and they come out in street clothes, and you can tell they're thrilled at having to come out and wipe up this mess. They walk purposefully to the ring, and the heels just step out, but the big tattooed Samoan didn't want to back off from Cash. He went out to the apron and just stood there, and Cash goes up, and he's just standing there. So there was a legitimate shoving incident. I thought we were going to have something else to report on. And then Joe came over from the other side of the ring with some element of force to make the point, and the fucking Samoan got down on the... the tattooed Samoan got down on the ground. And the Samoans, apparently, their name of their team is the Gates of Agony. And much like the heartbreak of psoriasis... They didn't get over with me. So this was this is setting up an eight-man tag, which what better place to hide the best tag team in wrestling and 
poor old Wardlow than in an eight man with poor Samoa Joe and this group of numb nuts that they're going to have to fucking fight. Your thoughts. They should name their pay-per-view pre-show the Gates of Agony. I think that would be more appropriate. Um, <laughs> I guess Brian Cage made some apologies to get back in that locker room. I'd like to know more about that. I'm sure I'll find out relatively soon after I say that. Look, Brian Cage works one kind of match, despite the fact that he, even though he's not tall, he's built like a monster. He wrestles like a cruiserweight. And he just, if you've seen his match, you've seen his match. Yeah. It was impressive when Wardlow hit that standing, uh, well, not standing, but that Frankensteiner early in the match. It was impressive. But Wardlow just needs to be squashing people. Well, as a, it would be impressive if war, if that was the most impressive thing that a big man did in the match. Yeah. But there's goddamn Cage superplexing the motherfucker off the top rope and doing all his goofy shit. You know, another thing, and I was going to bring it up if you had reviewed the Darby Allen uh, Jay Lethal match, which was a good match on paper. Well, I shouldn't say on paper. It was a good match, but the crowd was dead. The crowd's lethargic, and it's been going on now for multiple shows. You know, a lot of people pointed out this is the return to D.C. where they ran the first Dynamite and they had however many thousands there, 12,000. This time there were less than 4,000. I don't think that matters, but the fact that the people who are there aren't reacting to everything the same way, that's something to worry about. People reacted to FTR because they're thinking, where the fuck are FTR? <laughs> they got over as the most popular tag team in professional wrestling and then they never wrestled again on TV in a tag team match. It makes no sense whatsoever. FTR were out. People were happy to see them. I think Tony's going to definitely try to have Samoa Joe and Wardlow as a tag team. I just... Yeah. I mean, I don't want to just rip on everything, but I just hate the booking. The booking's so bad right now. And they're shoving Ring of Honor now down everyone's throat. And I hate to say it like that, but... I like Prince Nana. He just shows up all of a sudden. He's got a faction. They're now in the mix with this. Every match now is the handshakes. I don't know. I don't like the direction of like almost anything in AEW well, right again, now. Again, they're they're assuming that everybody watching this television show knows the Ring of Honor, Code of Honor, blah blah blah, and it's a big deal and etc. Et in, in the fans' minds, and a lot of people may say, "What the fuck's going on here?" And again, I don't care what promotion you're pushing. An eight-man clusterfuck like this is not going to get anybody anywhere. Speaking of clusterfucks, uh, the next match was Willow Nightingale, Athena, and Tony Storm with Soraya against Serena and Jamie Hayter and Penelope Pitstop with Dr. Britt Baker and Reba. And the baby faces won. And then Britt Baker and Soraya squared off and had, if you were trying to have a hockey fight with a Fabergé egg, that's what they did. We still don't know whether Soraya can do anything because they just grabbed each other, swung their fists in the general vicinity of each other, and nobody went down. And there was big schmoz with the other girls, and the heels bailed, and then Soraya hit a kick on Reba. And that was that. You know, it's sad how bad the women's division is because this match actually had some talented people. Jamie Hayter is making a case for being the best in-ring female in the whole business. In terms of in-ring, obviously not booked well or anything else, and she hasn't shown the personality yet to really be a top person, but she probably... Let's see what happens when they finally give her a chance here. Penelope Ford ain't bad. Uh, so she's pretty athletic and pretty good in there. Serena Deeb's pretty good. You know, the Soraya thing is the thing that feels like it's being forced right now. And the rumor is, the story is that now AEW cleared her medically. So she's going to maybe work with Britt Baker. How is that possible that the, if she was able to be cleared medically, that the WWE wouldn't have cleared her medically, especially while she was under contract to them and they were paying her? Maybe they were just waiting for her contract to expire. Maybe they said, well, she can't get cleared medically to our standards, so maybe she should go somewhere where the standards are lower. So the women's division has been booked horribly. Now they got Soraya there. Notice the pops for Soraya are not what they were for the first week's surprise debut. 
Ay, ay, ay. The acclaimed celebrated National Scissoring Day. Well, you know, I've, I've seen National Cheeseburger Day, National Pizza Day, National Puppy Day. When I was a kid, we didn't have all these national days. Who is in charge of making these national days? Is it a, is it a board? Is it a committee? How do we determine what day is a national day for something? I have no idea. Well, check it. Google that. If you won't Google whether fucking sheep is legal in Japan, at least you can Google that. Anyway, the <sighs> this is, was absolutely ridiculous, but the people loved it, and they did it well. At least the acclaimed and Billy. They've got fire. They've got oomph. Bowens did great. The material I wrote is preposterous, but they sound like they mean it. It's that line that you you kind of have to bump up against but can't cross where it's ridiculous, but the person looks like they believe it, mean it, or enjoying it, whatever, and you kind of get swept up in it. The people love these kids. And so, again, you know, this, this wasn't bad. It got long. But it wasn't bad. Um, and, of course, Billy presented the acclaimed with giant golden scissors. And there, Tony Schiavone's comment. By the way, did you see somebody tweeted two random matches? The Tony Schiavone commentary, like we asked it at one of the shows that we did last week. No, the stuff during the acclaimed segment was the stuff we really need transcribed. I think I may have it, too. I'll well, look. Well, I've got, I've got one of them, but, but the, the, the tweet was... He only says like six or seven lines per match anyway, but as soon as the the giant golden scissors get presented, Tony says, oh, this is so much fun. He's the worst commentator in wrestling. Okay, Tony, bless you. I love you. We've known each other since the 80s, but God damn it, the announcer is not supposed to say that like that. You're still supposed to be the goddamn announcer, the salesman of the product the person in charge of the television program. I can see somebody saying, well, folks, these guys are out there, but you don't just laugh along with it in that respect, like it, that you're just having so much fun because you're the announcer. You're not, uh, all right. It's not as bad as when they do it during matches, Shivani Tony and Scalber. Did, Tony did baseball. He did real sports. He's done real sports on radio for years. He's not, he didn't do real sports like that. This whole thing, I know the it, most of the show is a joke and he probably thinks it's a joke because he started in real wrestling, but don't talk about it like a joke. So anyway, the crowd, everybody scissored their neighbors and Caster closed with asking everybody to come together in a bipartisan scissor to unite the country. And here comes Swerve. Now, where is Keith Lee now? Is he hurt again? Is he shooting a movie? Where? Why is the both of the guys that lost the tag team title that are pissed at the acclaimed, why are they not together now? I don't know. Are people still dealing with hurricane issues? Is he in Florida? Well, it's it's been a goddamn week, one would think. Well, still, if you have a lot of flooding and everything, I'm not saying that's the case, but you could be dealing with it still. I don't know why Keith Lee wasn't there. All righty. Well, he cut a heel promo, did Swerve, and next week in Toronto, we get Billy versus Swerve. And okay, and that that's not bad. Maybe Swerve and Keith Lee will get some heat on the acclaimed father figure. That, But then suddenly, here comes Mark Sterling. So the segment had been good. The interview had been good. Scissoring day, people loved it. It might have gone a little long on television, but we we got there, we got swerved, we got the match for next week, and then here comes Mark Sterling, and everything goes to shit. Because, again, he's not trying to be a real manager. He's being a comedy buffoon. And he wants to help the acclaimed beat Swerve and Lee by them joining his... He's so phony. And so the acclaimed and Billy Gunn beat up Sterling and Billy accepts the match with Swerve, but then Sterling disappeared after getting beat up, and then the baby faces all scissored each other. 
until why Sterling's presence was not even necessary. Swerve could have made the challenge. Billy could have fucking accepted it and, and everybody could have scissored and nobody need to take any bumps in that segment. And Sterling meant nothing like usual. So that mucked the whole thing up. At the end. They almost made it. What do you think? I agree with you about the material. I didn't like this just because I don't like this style of segment on a wrestling show. I don't find it enjoyable, but I recognize that everyone there does. And that's what makes this acceptable. When we see too many people doing bad material and no one reacts, the people in that room were eating up everything they were doing. And that's why it works. When Swerve came out, I have to say, I love him as a heel. And I can understand now why Triple H wants him back so badly for Hit Row. I like Swerve a lot as a heel. He feels natural on the mic. Let's see how they fuck this up. And I completely agree with you about Mark Sterling. Anytime you see Mark Sterling, he's in the cringe crew. There's a bunch of people in AEW, as soon as they appear on TV, you cringe. And Mark Sterling's one of the leaders of the cringe crew. And no one wanted to see any of that. It was unnecessary. Well, speaking of unnecessary, the next match was Hangnail Page against Rush. And... Roosh. Yeah, well, you do and you'll clean it up. So, I skipped this. Uh, honestly, the finish was, I don't want to look at that empty... What was empty-headed, know-nothing that's never done anything in this business? Uh, it, maybe if he listened to advice, old Hangnail, I would watch his matches, but... The finish was Rush hitting the sloppiest, most dangerous-looking pile driver that I have ever seen for a two-count. And then seconds later, Page was 100%, leaped up, hit a clothesline, jumped over the top rope, jumped back over the top rope with a flip, and hit a buckshot lariat one, two, three. So, somehow he not only has a superhuman neck... Did you see the pile driver? It was a, like he had a double arm, picked the guy up like he was going to pedigree, but picked him up and then jumped up and he didn't have control of, of fucking Page. He didn't land flat. He couldn't even execute it properly. And I wouldn't even have wished that on Adam fucking Page. But that, I would have never taken that in a million fucking years. And I don't know why they let him give it to anybody, but but it fortunately, like I said, it didn't hurt Page because within three seconds he was a hundred percent and doing his moves full force. Did I miss anything here? No, it was not a match you would like. Roosh seems to have kind of taken the place of Andrade. He now has Jose the assistant with him, and he dresses like Andrade and acts like Andrade and the promo backstage earlier. Uh you know, I'm with you on Adam Page. I think he's full of shit. I don't know why they're giving him any kind of push or any kind of wins, but I guess that says a lot about AEW management, too. Although some would argue he's been a pawn in this whole thing, but that's a whole other story. Well, he's not bright enough to be the leader, but he should know who to follow. Well, he's not bright enough to know who to follow, either. Yeah. Nothing else really to say about this. I mean, there's right now... It seems like AEW is really capped with talent right now, especially top-tier talent, so I can understand... For that reason, why they would turn back to Adam Page. He is a former world champion. But I don't know. This Again, this is the part of the show here. The women's match didn't really lose the audience. Everything from this point on, the audience disappeared. They decided to leave the TV. Adam Page was their world champion, but people don't care enough to tune in to see him. Well, it wasn't over because here comes Private Party to the ring. Because they're involved somehow with their rotating managers. But then Moxley comes out to make sure that Private Party turns around and walks off, which they do. And then Moxley cuts promo on Page, and they go head to head, and Page is trying to make mean faces. And here, Deja Vu all over again. Two baby faces about to have a world title match. Again, October 18th in Cincinnati. Moxley's hometown. Yeah, he can't be. A, I, you know, I didn't even think about Cincinnati. I was just going to say anywhere. I don't think Adam Page could be a babyface against Moxley right now in AEW. And well, that's not even that's not even referring to like the backstage drama. Just how Moxley is over with that crowd. So it was basically what you would expect from Moxley, and you know, then he goes to leave, and Page calls him back, 
and Moxley starts talking to him again. They bleep shit. They're bleeping shit everywhere now on AEW. And then Moxley tells him again to watch his mouth and walks off and leaves him again. It's, Where did he come from? Very bizarre. Where did he come from when Private Party came out? Where was Moxley? I guess he was at the fucking concession stand getting a hot dog. That's what I want to know. Where is the character of John Moxley supposed to be all show? So that he's ready to just walk out there, not run they out They ought to have cutaways every time they go to a commercial break. No matter what's going on, they ought to have a cutaway to a fucking card table in a parking lot where Moxley's putting his boots on. And then the next match was Dino Douche against the fake midget luchador that weighs 120 pounds who he beat quickly and then started getting more heat on. And then Jungle Boy came out and hit Dino with a chair. And Dino took the bump to the floor where Christian Cage was holding him back. And Jungle Boy got the microphone and told Dino that he used to be his best friend, but he chose Christian and broke my heart. You're not doing it justice. He was screaming at him, You are my best friend! But you chose him and broke my heart. <laughs> uh, he and, and we're not even going to make the the obvious called for romantic entanglement jokes. But is that a thing that a grown man says to another grown man? And Jungle Boy sounds both fake and like a dork at the same time you can tell that this is memorized verbiage he's reciting because he does it with such little emotion but it sounds like that if you can't even put it in adult male verbiage you must be of just a fucking blithering dork at the same time so uh... So poor Jungle Boy's got a broken heart. And again, we'll talk about the ratings breakdown, but people tuning out. Jungle Boy's not causing anyone to stop and want to see him. And I think it could have been different, and it may have been different early on, but it could have been a lot different. They have booked him into the dirt. Well, remember, I, I love this guy at the start because I said he's got an intangible personal charisma to look at him. And when he has veterans on him that are leading him in the ring and his matches make sense because of that, and he sells, he gets sympathy and he, he has fiery athletic ability to make comebacks. And, but the problem is not only he has not grown, he's not expanded, he's not gotten better, but he's been in more matches than 80% of the matches he's been in are with the rest of the fucking trampoline cowboys that bring out his worst instincts and all he's doing is holding hands and flipping. And ultimately, apparently, I've never met him, but he apparently has the personality of fucking wilted cabbage. He, he, we saw that he did a, he made a statement on the internet that he runs and hides when they try to get him to do promos because he doesn't like to talk on camera. And now, once we've heard him do it a bunch, we know why. There's no personality there. There's no passion there. He can't fucking take command of, of the space, the room, the arena, whatever, verbally. And so he stalled. And there's been nobody, that, if they made him a project and only put him in with guys that could teach him, he might be better along, but I don't think you can, at this point, you know, you can't teach personality unless you start giving him some kind of electric shock therapy or something at this point. Anyway, the main event of the evening was Jericho and Guevara versus Garcia and Danielson. So again, Daniel Garcia in the last segment, old Wheeler in the first segment, way in over their heads in deep water. And Sammy was obviously spared from being sent home so that it didn't fuck up Chris Jericho's fucking big angle and this main event tag team match that lost 
I heard it was exactly 300,000 viewers from the start of the program, and it was heavily advertised all night long, and it was it lost 300,000 viewers from start of the program to finish. And not only did Sammy get to stay after instigating another backstage brawl, and I've heard had people say, oh, they said Sammy didn't do anything. Andre was the one that threw the first punches. I'll tell you what Sammy did. Sammy got on Twitter and told this fucking guy, hey, fuck you. You're a loser. You're a favor hire. If it wasn't for your father-in-law, you wouldn't be here. Why don't you fucking go ahead and quit? I'll see you on Wednesday. So what the fuck? He saw him on Wednesday. So I say, if, if, if Andre got sent home and is sitting in his house going, ole, 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 all by himself, then Sammy ought to be sitting there with Ty Melo Conti on his lap pontificating about his goddamn drawbacks and fucking behavior as well. But anyway, not only that, he wrestled and got the prestigious victory over Daniel Garcia. Garcia got a cloverleaf on Sammy, and Jericho reached in and hit him in the head with the Ring of Honor title belt, and Sammy covered him one, two, three. So there you go. 300,000 people decided, fuck it. We do not want to hang around and watch that. Nobody wants total nonstop Jericho. And that's what they're getting in every Jericho segment. And I that really, I mean, what else can you say about that match? We And that's pretty much what we've said. And that was the show. And again, the ratings went from, what was it, close to one 1.2 almost to 800 and some thousand. Well, here are the ratings breakdown. I'll give you this right now. Okay. The show started Wheeler Yuta versus MJF. And by the way, these are courtesy of WrestleNomics who posted them. 1,179,000 viewers. That's the peak. Segment two, which is the last four minutes of the match, as well as a Jericho Appreciation Society promo and Lethal versus Darby starting. 1,155,000. So a very slight drop off. Segment three, the last seven minutes of Lethal vs. Darby, Brian Cage's promo, and Wardlow vs. Brian Cage, 1,084,000. So that's the first significant drop. The last seven minutes of that match, and the post-match angle, and Britt Baker's promo was segment four, 1,074,000, which goes into segment five, the first segment of the nine o'clock hour, 1,058,000 for the women's six-person tag match and Roosh's promo. The Acclaim segment, 1,013,000. And then segment six, excuse me, segment, yeah, that's segment six. Segment six, which was Madison Rain and Sky Blue's promo with Anna Jay and Ty Conti, as well as Rush versus Adam Page. 953,000 viewers. The next segment, which was the Luchasaurus versus Fuego del Sol match, <laughs> with also uh, Jungle Boy, as well as a Trent Beretta pack promo video, oh and a promo from Willow Nightingale, Jade Cargill, and the Baddies, 944,000. And the final segment, Daniel Garcia and Brian Danielson versus Sammy, Gar Sammy Garcia, Sammy Guevara and Chris Jericho, 879,000. The mm. biggest drop off of the night. Well, there you have it. So, what does that tell you? The fact that MJF is it just cuz he was in the first segment? Now, you know what? Well, no, it's interesting. We just on. said, we just said on the show, we were talking about the ratings recently how Jericho versus Moxley held the number to the end, remember? Yeah, yeah. And then it was Jericho versus Garcia that didn't, and we said, "Oh, well, there's the difference between two main eventers and not." Now you realize they don't even want to see Jericho. The drop-off is Jericho. If Jericho's in the last segment of the show, people don't care enough to stay. And you can't argue with that because the numbers are bearing it out. And it's not they had a decent audience up until seg six and seven. And then it was just this last match. But again, when they advertise a match that people want to see for the main event, they stick around for it. And you go back to the days of Raw and Nitro battling it out. 
the last segment was always the highest, and it was still at the same time of night, same time of night. It was always the highest rated segment of the program. It did, the, the programs didn't lose viewers, they gained viewers. Because people wanted to see the main event. It was somebody they wanted to see. So, and sp let, let's mention this real briefly, because talking about things that people want to see or don't want to see, AEW also had two hours of national television on Friday night. The regular Rampage and the Battle of the Belts, which they have so many of. And when you look at the lineup, who would want to see any of this? It's YouTube level, fucking dark match level stuff on national television. And it's Mox this, I was going to just say too, and it's the stuff they build up on Wednesday and people still don't want to see it. Yep. Yeah, Moxley on the Rampage show was the only legitimate star on that program and on the battle of the belts honestly ftr if you can call them legitimate stars the way that they are booked where they listen to these matches real quick and then folks we're done with aew i know you're you can't wait rampage was moxley claudio and wheeler useless against rush and private party pack and felix and penthouse against the dork order Anna J and Ty Melo Conti against Madison Rain and Sky Blue, and Tony Nice and Josh Woods against the Varsity Blondes. Every single one of these names, except for the Blackpool Combat Club fellows, are usually used to do jobs and in shitty matches. <laughs> and then the Battle of the Belts. For the prestigious Atlantic title that nobody gives a shit about. Pack All Atlantic. against Trent. All Atlantic. All Atlantic. The whole ocean. <laughs> Pack against Trent. I guess so. I guess that is what it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and for the TBS title, Jane Cargill against Willow Nightingale. And for the Ring of Honor tag team title, FTR against those two fat Samoans that didn't even want to jump out of the fucking ring for him. Gates of Agony. Those were the, that's two hours of national television time. <sighs> anyway, you know what the problem is, don't you? Yeah, the booking's never been worse. No, it's that they're not listening to the right people. That's true. See, what Tony Khan is doing is he's listening to the voices in his head. And he's doing what they tell him to do. But the problem is, he doesn't have his Raycon wireless earbuds in. So those are not really announcers or broadcasters or people that he's listening to that might know what the fuck that they're talking about. It's his own psychopathic voices inside his head that's giving him bad advice because the first thing that he should do is know not to listen to himself, right? You're asking me to confirm that Tony Khan should not listen to himself? Yes. In anything or just in wrestling matters? Just if anything. If he says to himself, he says, self, I ought to turn left, he ought to turn right. Well, I wouldldn't say that, but I would say he should go against booking, he, he should go against every natural instinct that he has. And he should listen to other people. And they'll sound great if he's listening to them on those Raycon wireless earbuds. Folks, if you see people walking down the street having a conversation with themselves, nobody else with them, but they're talking or they're singing. It's not because they're crazy. It's because they're listening to what they want to listen to on their Raycon wireless earbuds. And these things, they're so perfect to go in your ears, you can't even tell you got them in. People can't even see them. As a matter of fact, let's say, for example, you go to Las Vegas and you go in the casino and you get in one of those high stakes poker games where millions of dollars can be won or lost. If you wear your Raycon wireless earbuds and you make arrangements with a compadre or cohort, they can get binoculars and look at the other people's hands and they can broadcast what they have in their hands to you, courtesy of the Raycon wireless earbuds. And people will never know that you have them in.
they better never know you have them in because if they find out, that means you're trying to cheat. And it, since it's Las Vegas, they will have you taken out behind the casino and all your legs will be broken. That is not Both what Raycon your legs, does. Three nope. legs. What? Well, no, Raycon wouldn't do it. Right. The casino people would do it. The guys with oh, the yeah, crooked do. noses would yeah. do it. The Guido and Vito, they well, would do hey, it. Well, hey, that's discriminatory. But certainly people that work in a casino would love to break the legs of anyone who's cheating. That's true. They break both your legs, all three of your legs. How many legs you got, they'll break them. So that means that what you need to do is you need to get the special Raycon everyday wireless earbuds that are flesh colored. So that way, when you're cheating at cards at a casino in Las Vegas, people don't know you have these things in your ears because they won't fall out. Trust me. They will not budge. We've talked about how once they go in, they're in there for a while. You just try to get them some bitches out. And you'll get quality audio at half the price of other premium audio brands. That's right. And That's you'll also be able to get them out of your ear at any point you want. Well, the other premium audio brands jack the price up significantly and try to cheat you. But Raycon doesn't do that. They want your repeat business and they want you to be happy. That's why they've got over 50,000 five-star reviews and many of those reviews come from ear nose and throat doctors who have taken raycon wireless earbuds out of patients ears or no. noses or throats no nope. and they use them themselves and they find that they sound better than the ones that they've had as well that may sound nice ladies and gentlemen but it's not true well it, it's nobody has actually proven it but i i suspectify Anyway, they got three customizable sound profiles. They've got the earbud tap functions. Anytime you want to tap one of these earbuds, you're allowed to. And also there's the noise isolation mode and the awareness mode. So you can either isolate yourself from noise, which is what you want to do most of the time, because let's face it, the whole world today is just one big headache. Or when occasionally you want to become aware of your surroundings, then you tap that and suddenly you have full awareness and consciousness, and you can speak on the same plane as the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Very so, good. Very, very good. Right now, full awareness, folks. Right now, go to buyraycon.com. That's B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N. That's so melodious. Buyraycon.com, and use the code JCE15 to get 15% off your Raycon order. That's code JCE15 at buyraycon.com. 15% off. You can listen to music. You can listen to podcasts. You can block out your nagging wife and, and uh, annoying children. You, can, you won't even hear the noise of the oncoming train if that's the way you want to go out in a flame of glory. Don't We don't advise that. Nope. No, especially not on the bridge. But, you know, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. No, you don't. You got to do the right thing. You got to do the right thing. Sometimes the right thing would be stepping out in front of that train. It just depends on what your situation is. Well, it depends on the person. There's a few people I'd like to see step in front of a train, to be honest with you. Yes, it might not be best for them, but it'd be best for us. I don't know if they're going to do it willingly. Yeah, well, sometimes people have to be coerced. Buyraycon.com. JCE15 is the code 15% off. Boy, howdy. You'll love the way these things feel when you stick them in your ear holes. Well, I guess we have nothing left then to do but to talk about SmackDown in preparation for the big Extreme Rules showdown that we uh, mentioned earlier we will end the program with after a short break. You'll never know we were away, folks, but SmackDown on Friday. Last week, we thought the show was good, right? I remember having a favorable impression of much of it, better than normal. I mitigate these compliments because i don't want anybody to take it the wrong way uh but <sighs> there, it, this week was a lot of ado about not very much in my opinion uh triple h started the show and you can tell that <laughs> i know they 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 cheered they had a reaction when vince came out um the fans i'm talking about in the arenas when he would come out on television but do you think that Triple H is getting a little bit more of a beloved response rather than a, wow, it's Vince, the evil man the himself kind of response. Yeah, I think it's also important that they haven't, since the transition away from Vince, they haven't really had a heel authority figure. And that's important. They should keep doing that. So when you do see yeah. someone like Triple H, it'll be interesting the next time Stephanie's out there. If they're treated seriously, people are open to hearing them. The other thing is, 
And I know he went through a lot, but this is the first time you saw Triple H and he kind of looked like an old man. You know, he kind of looked, I, I don't know what the word, not sickly, but. Well, no, well, he's lost weight and one should because he's older, he's had heart issues, needs to drop weight, and he's not in competition anymore. But there was the, you know, I mean, here was the guy with the long flowing locks that looked like Thor. If they were ever going to do a Thor movie, they, they missed their chance. Um, I know they've got some yahoo now that's going to be Thor, but no, Triple H was Thor. Well, the Thor in the movies is pretty awesome. He's better than Triple H ever could have been. Well, but I, the Triple H looked like Thor, though. Well, Chris Hemsworth ended up looking kind of like Thor. All right. Well, it, well, don't get Thor. I like those Avengers movies. You'd love them, you, too, if you, you gave him a chance. Did you, you hear about the day after the all the Norse gods got together and had a big orgy? Did you hear about that? Who was Thor? They they partied all night. They fucked all the women there in Asgard. And then the next day, Thor woke up, and he was next to this beautiful naked woman. And he looked at her, and he said, Hi, I'm Thor. And she said, You're Thor. I'm so Thor, I can hardly piff. Horrible. But anyway. And this so, is SmackDown, ladies and gentlemen. This is SmackDown. <laughs> it's going to get worse from here. But he welcomed us to the season premiere of SmackDown, Triple H did. When everything is finished, that is the beginning. And then he got the fuck out of there. You know, he did the Costanza thing. I got over and got out. Um, but they, the, the fans, they want to, and they're, they're going to be done. I think they're smart enough to realize no more heel authority figures in the WWE. That day is over because they need the fans to like their company, not just their wrestlers. All right, so the first segment, they bring out the stars. Here comes Roman and the Bloodline, and they are over. And again, we don't need to say what we say every week, but Heyman's expressions are priceless. Sami Zayn is a, ste a scene stealer. And Roman does the acknowledge me, and then here comes the Logan Paul music. And then I'm thinking, this early? And Logan, the one thing is, <sighs> Logan Paul comes in six on one. And obviously, the bloodline played it off like they're not going to attack him and everything, but it's, it seemed awfully brave on his part. But nevertheless, Heyman cuts promo, and he promos everybody. And I've heard the name, who is Ben Shapiro? And why is, is Paul Heyman saying that, that uh, Ben Shapiro couldn't kick Roman Reigns' ass? Uh, is that what he said? I well, didn't what, hear that he's, promo. he's talking about all the people that that uh, that Logan Paul steps up to challenge Roman Reigns. Not a lot of other people didn't. Andrew Tate, whoever the fuck Andrew Tate is, he's talking about Ben Shapiro and Andrew Tate and everybody. He's naming podcast. I mean, Ben Shapiro is a major conservative podcaster. So I mean, I'm guessing, and Logan okay. Paul's a major podcaster, so I'm guessing okay. he's just naming podcasters. Okay, well, none of those people have the balls to fight Roman Reigns, but Logan Paul does. And finally, when Logan Paul starts answering back, he gets whatted bad. And they don't what Heyman. They're smart enough not to, because you never know what might come back at you from Heyman. He's smart enough the, to stop it, too. Well, yeah, the, the Sean Waltman rule about me works on Paul Heyman, too. Do not engage verbally. And so he's getting whatted, and then he starts arguing with Jey Uso, and Sammy interrupted to bring it back in and got massive cheers. They have made Sammy Zayn an incredible babyface with this thing. So everybody spoke well in this promo where they're talking about the match between them and Saudi Arabia, but absolutely nothing happened. They talked to each other, and then they all left, and it, we were 20 minutes into the show. So, you know, I've, I'm not saying it was better than a lot of bad matches they have just to get to hear Heyman and Sammy talk and, you know, see the bloodline, but... Mm, They're wasting uh, that match on Saudi Arabia. Well, now... <laughs> Here, when we first, when they first announced it, I said, well, they don't have to sell tickets on it. They, you know, the Saudi Arabia show is sold. It's like a giant $50 million county fair show. So they don't need to waste a marquee match like Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar or whatever. But now are you saying that maybe 
at this point, they are so bereft of money matches. There is such a dearth of money drawing talent that Logan Paul and Roman Reigns may be a money drawing match. I think if built up right, it could be certainly Logan Paul's well, as big a star sh- there as any of the people they have. Then they are shit in the bed, aren't they? Giving it to the Saudi Arabians. Those and Alibaba and the 40 thieves. Anyway, so then they obviously have to follow up with the bloodline being involved in a match coming out of that interview. And the match they picked was Ricochet versus Solo Sokoa, which Solo won, obviously, because they're pushing him. And we're 35 minutes into the show. And we've seen one match and most of the same people. And then we go back to Roman Reigns' locker room where Jay and Sammy are arguing. And Roman Reigns takes Sammy Zayn's side on Jay being a hothead, but now he tells Sammy, so that means he's your problem. He's been our problem all our life. Now he's your problem. And then they come back from the break and Sammy and the Usos are in the hallway arguing with each other when they come upon the new day and they start arguing with them. But none of these people are, well, the bloodline amongst themselves are arguing like they're mad and they don't like each other. But the New Day, it's all just, ha ha. It's all like the same thing. They run into people in the hallway and they exchange scripted, allegedly smart-ass remarks that nobody would really say. And then, stop me if you want to jump in anywhere, Brian, but I'm just trying to hit the high points on this, because there weren't that many. Yeah, good luck. So then Skid Row comes to the ring. And they are, oh, I'm sorry, Death Row. or Hit uh, Row. Hit Row. Jump back, gotta kiss myself one time. Oh! So they come to the ring, and they haven't even finished their entrance when they are attacked by three men in suits and lucha masks. And son of a gun, wouldn't you know who the won the pony? It's the Lucha Suits group from NXT. But now they have Zelina Vega with them. Didn't they have and a different woman with them in NXT? They I don't They had a different one of the right. women in NXT with them. I and, think. and Zelina didn't used to be blonde either. Oh, she's blonde now. She's blonde watch, now. I didn't watch this segment. You didn't watch that? Well, yeah, she's blonde now. And Top Dollar looked like a fucking beached whale within this beatdown. It was sloppy and blah. And I guess now uh, poor old Andre needs to stay in AEW because his spot has been taken. He's the lucha guy that wears a suit. But now they got three more of them over here. If I was Tony Khan, this is the stuff I would look to as, as a way to fight WWE in the future. Triple H is bringing up all the last batch of NXT people, you know, minus Mike, uh, Michael Cole, minus Adam Cole and Keith Lee. And I guess, where's Dijakovic? I don't even know. But look at this. I mean, these are, I don't think all these people should be on the main roster. The whole show, though, it was Shotzi Blackheart, the legends of the Phantasma Brothers. The whole show is now starting to be filled up with the NXT batch, Karrion Cross. I don't know if, and we'll see how they, push everyone and try to do everything but none of these people were particularly impressive to me in nxt and now they're all filling up this show so you're thinking a lot of new faces but the numbers will people won't be able to see the forest for the trees a lot of new faces but are any of them new faces that showed an ability in nxt to get people really invested in them i can't believe the the i know now apparently why that vince decided to fire the row the row crowd because apparently he they they got rid of the girl first b fab as the way i recall they they gave her notice and she's the only one that looks like a star out of all of them well but the thing is i don't think we've seen her work and if we have we haven't seen it much and she looks a little awkward kind of walking around oh no she's fine she's fine but they then top dollar old AJ from most wanted treasures. Apparently the story was he went to Vince and just told him why he made a mistake and they said, fine, and we'll fire all of you. And the one that escaped and is still over on the other side is swerve, but top dollar, Jesus H. Christ. First they were rapping on the way to the ring. Now they, they won't let him rap anymore. 
Apparently, they realized that, that was not a thing they should be doing. Top Dollar looks like a late 30s fucking fat mechanic that dresses like a hip-hop guy and wallers around in the ring like a beached whale. And I don't know, apparently Triple H liked them as a, as a group and brought them back and is trying to push them, but oh boy. And this beatdown was sloppy as shit to begin with. So we got that going for us. You see why they wanted to get Swerve back, don't you? Yes, because out of the whole bunch, he's the one I'd pick. So then they had a tag team match with Cruella DeVille and Zaya Lee against Shotzi with her tank and Raquel Gonzalez Rodriguez de la Mascaris. And then they followed that with a package on Ronda Rousey and Liv Morgan, all the stupid stuff that they did trying to get Liv Morgan over in a fruitless attempt. And we were an hour into the show after all of that. And then here we go. We're going to juice up Extreme Rules, right? Karrion Cross and Scarlett make their entrance. They're in the black and white treated video. They got the music, fall and pray, fall and pray. Just as it turns into color and they're in the ring, Drew McIntyre appears from behind Karrion Cross. <laughs> Didn't we just see this? Uh, people attacked on their entrance. In the previous segment, they attacked the people on their entrance. It, it, well, while security were being yelled at for that, it happened again because they were distracted. Well, no, because they didn't have security before when they got attacked on their entrance. But now they got security, so security showed up late and should be fine. But McIntyre jumps on Karrion Cross and puts the strap on him. Again, like they did last week in their impromptu thing when the fireball fucking fizzled. And, but here comes security in, and I was about to say, okay, they're listening. These guys look like security. They were big old boys. They didn't look like fucking phony-ass scared indie wrestlers. I'm sure they're still indie wrestlers, but they looked halfway legitimate. And it wasn't that they were just running toward Drew McIntyre to take an awkward bump and then disappear. They were all on him, trying at least to hold him. He headbutted one, he elbows another. He's fighting them like a man would in a bar fighting security. And then when he's dispatched all of them, Cross uses the strap to pull McIntyre into the post, which that'd be fine except he then did it about another six or eight times at various points. And Karrion Cross hadn't had a lot of experience with strap matches. I know the strap was long. They've advertised a 14-foot long strap, and that's very long. The ones that I used to see Wahoo use, the ones that we used in Crockett or Smoky Mountain or whatever, usually eight feet, maybe ten feet point i'm making is cross was just pulling the strap without cinching up on it and really giving it the heave for a 275 pound man to fly into the ring post and then he did that six or seven times more like i said to show the people exactly how they could see through it then he's whipping mcintyre and he's whipping the shit out of him but he needed work on immobilizing him he'd pull him into the post then mcintyre would lean there and then he'd whip him if you pull the guy and the guy's arm has got the strap on it then when you pull his arm through the fucking buckle you can wrap a little bit of that strap around it where there's some visual semblance of the guy being immobilized and then use the rest of it to whip it's just little things but the biggest part was after Drew dispatched security, this thing went on, and you could vaguely see in the background a guy's foot still laying there. They were still selling. So they had security on the scene, and it looked okay for what they did, but then once that Drew had beat him up for carrying cross to beat him up, they had to stay down too long because the heat went on too long because they cross kept trying to put McIntyre in the right place and blah, blah, blah. So it wasn't a bad angle. It could have been better with somebody that had more experience in strap or chain matches. 
uh, at least they're trying with the security. I, you know, I give it a, a thumb partially up. What do you think? Partially up. We'll see where they go. They're trying to do something with Karrion Cross. Drew McIntyre has been bungled booking-wise for a while. Let's see what happens. Well, and then we had a six-man tag, and I know you're not going to believe this, Brian, but guess who was in a six-man tag? Well, you know you saw, but the Usos and Sam, another bloodline match against the New Day and Brown Strawman. And I got to be honest with you on this one, I kind of zoned out, and then I got distracted. I'm loving Sammy, whatever he does. Strowman, he needs to be like Andre. See him once every six weeks or eight weeks wrestle or whatever on TV, maybe. Yeah. Make it, you know, sparing. I agree. Book him like Andre or FTR. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, where you barely ever see him, and that way you, you know. But anyway, uh, Strowman has fire. When he makes his comeback, I'll say that for him. But he's sloppy as shit. Uh, maybe some of it is he's so big and heavy that he doesn't want to really hurt or crush anybody. But his shit looks kind of me. Eh. And he did the thing where he ran around the ring, choo-choo, and tackled Sammy and Jay over the announce desk onto Michael Cole. I know you uh, enjoyed that part of it. And then the New Day beat Jimmy with a double-team move, one, two, three. So there was lots of bleeping of the Usos language on the floor, but you know, here New Day and Braun Strowman, first time they've ever been a, a team and they beat the top heel group that they're trying to get heat on Roman. I don't know what, I guess everybody just has to win sometime in this world. I'm not but, a fan of the New Day, so I didn't watch. Um, it, it, We both appreciate the fact that apparently they're willing to admit when they make mistakes because <laughs> they didn't give hardly any time to this. This was a 30 second backstage deal, but at least for us completionists who demand things be explained, Max Dupree, they go to the back and there's Max Dupree standing over Mansoor and Mansois. He's already beat him up. They didn't even have time for us to see him beat him up. And he's telling the girl Basically, fuck this shit. You know, uh, you guys have screwed this whole thing up. I don't want to be a part of it anymore. I'm L.A. Knight and walks off. So now this garbage gimmick will be forgotten why it was ever done in the first place. Apparently comes down to Vince being out of his mind. But they've realized and corrected a mistake in the way that one of their talents was being presented detrimental to everything his career our enjoyment television program and they corrected it calling tony khan so at least that we got la knight back see what they do with him from here but at least we don't have to worry about the titillation of our creamiest pleasures or whatever what well, that's what they were saying. What was it? The guilty, guilty pleasures, creamy pleasures. Who's saying this? Garlic pleasures. That was the, the maximum male model's motto. We titillate the juices of your guilty pleasures. All right. Mm-hmm. All right. And finally, the match we all waited for, Gunther versus Sheamus. The rematch of their their Donny Brook at the pay per view, and this wasn't as good because it it was interrupted with commercials, and it was a TV match, and they weren't over there on the pay per view and in front of that rousing crowd of sixty something thousand. But as far as I mean, you know, Sheamus tries. He's not a smooth worker, but he's he's tough and he's laying his shit in, and he's trying. And Gunther is one of the five best talents in the industry today of any company. And this was at least a serious slobber knocker of a wrestling match. And, you know, I, I get the WWE crowd reacts to serious shit that, you know, people are laying shit in and not 
you know, doing flips and not fighting with furniture. When they see it, they react to it and they like it. They just don't get the chance to see it often enough. But, you know, the problem with this match was only that it was on television. They start out with a fight. They go out to the floor and they're to the break within 60 seconds after the bell. So you can't really get your get your mind in it without the interruptions. They they you want to talk about the white rabbit thing for a second? Okay. They did the more of the white rabbit shit in this first break, where the video game music and the rabbit goes down in a hole. And I haven't seen al almost any of this because I skipped the commercials and I skipped the shit that doesn't look like wrestling. So I've I haven't seen any of it. I've heard. Some of it, including what do they call those codes that you scan with your phone? A QR code? Help a QR code. Thank you. I knew you'd help me eventually. The first time I saw one of those, I was in Ring of Honor back in what, 2011. And I was proofing one of the advertising posters. I said, Well, the printer left this big goddamn black and white blotch in a square down here. Is that supposed to be a picture? They said, Oh, no, you can scan it with your phone and. It does something. So they've been, I know for folks of our age group, ladies and gentlemen out there, well, gentlemen, I don't know about any ladies, that may sound stupid, but kids actually do shit like this these days. But that's where they've been giving all the cues out and everything, and apparently uh, the fans will probably riot and set the seats on fire if the White Rabbit is not revealed to be Bray Wyatt on Extreme Rules later tonight that we're going to talk about at the end of this program, right? And that's the way they've been promoting his return, where you have to go out and you have to solve the mystery. It's like a scavenger hunt. You got to track down all the clues they're using uh, or using the technology to give you, which basically means that. People have to work to find out and solve the fucking mystery. Used to, we advertised shit right out in front of them in plain language that we wanted them to know, that we thought might enable them to spend some money with us. But now they're, they're giving the fans homework to do to determine whether they want to see the show. You're younger than I am. Is this a good marketing strategy, ploy, whatever? Do the, the kids get into this kind of thing? I think they do. I think it's gotten everyone talking and buzzing and guessing. People are probably more interested in this than they'll be in any of his matches. So I think it's good for that. And I do think a lot of people like, you know, there's a reason why games where you have to solve puzzles are popular. I think people do dig it. Well, the last time that I was buzzing and talking and guessing, I'd sat down on a fire ant hill. So anyway, Gunther and Sheamus, they're still wrestling. And... Again, Gunther looks incredible physically. They had a serious fight. They laid shit in. I like the way Gunther works with anybody. And they even did the chop and forearm trade correctly, where they weren't standing there going, okay, you chop me, and then I'm going to chop you on purpose, and you're going to stand there and let me do it. They were one two and with body language and emotion, forearms and chops, back and forth, boom, 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 and then they went to another break. And they came back. And finally, Sheamus got the 10 broadarms in that Gunther had foiled before, and he actually did the 10 broadarms on each of all three ropes, and people were going nuts. And then Sheamus hit his finish off the second rope, got a two count. And Gunther hit a power bomb, got a two count, big pop. And then Gunther hit that splash off the top, another two count. And then came the the point that I was like, what the fuck happened here? This whole thing's been cooking. They're getting the two counts. The people are into it. Sheamus gets a clover leaf. Gunther looks like he's trying to fight and fight to the ropes. And suddenly, the referee, the, the uh, female referee, Jessica, she's right there on it. And suddenly, Gunther, with his left hand, reached out and tapped the mat twice, and the people popped like he's tapping out. And then immediately, she's on camera, and she waves it off like, no, no, it's not a tap out. And then here come Imperium and Butch and Ridge Holland, and they get in a big fight at ringside. And while she's distracted, the referee 
Oh, Kaiser slips Gunther the shillelagh, and he re comes up and hits a clothesline with the shillelagh on Sheamus and covers him one, two, three. But nobody understood. I don't understand. I can't even figure out what they were trying to do and didn't come across. He tapped out, did he not? What did you think? Well, he only tapped twice. Technically, any match you've seen end, I started thinking about this. That's how stupid it is. Yeah. Usually you see at least three times. Right, right. He, he only did two and then he reached his hand up. Well, Almost like, come on! <laughs> In the in the UFC, sometimes they they might go out before they tap the third time, but it's the the tapping motion like that. But he, but it wasn't a it choke. It was almost like he wanted everybody to see it, but I don't know what what the red herring was. Why? Because the fans in the arena thought that he had tapped out, and then when she waved it off and said he didn't, the fans started booing. And now Sheamus can say I tapped you out, and he could say no, you didn't. But. He did. That's a, it wasn't like he tapped, but the referee was distracted, so he's trying to claim he didn't tap. He tapped, and the referee saw it, but said, no, that's not a tap, but it looked like a tap to the people. If he wasn't tapping, what was he trying to do? This is what I don't understand about this. The rest of the match was great. The finish, except for that particular incident, worked. But I don't know what the fuck they were going for or why that happened. You wouldn't think Gunther would be a guy that would forget where he was and just, you know, reach out and start. I mean, if, if you watch tapes of matches from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, before tapping out became a thing, when a guy was in a submission hold, he would slap the mat constantly. Uh, portraying that he was in pain or in agony. Oh, boy, he's slapping him out, trying to go to... And nobody thought a thing because there was not a visual tap-out rule in the that era. In wrestling, there was no MMA. There wasn't a tap-out in wrestling. It didn't happen. That's a modern MMA development that has crossed over into wrestling. Did he forget he was in a submission hold and... <laughs> And it would be taken as a submission if he tapped. I don't fucking know. But that looked out of place and was the, the only thing I couldn't figure out about this whole fucking match. But there you have that. Yeah, and that was SmackDown. They gave it a lot of time, given that. Yeah, and, and it did the match didn't get old, especially when they kept breaking it up in in with commercial breaks. So they had time. I'm not I'm not arguing with anything about that match except what was that spot, and it took everybody's attention away and was the thing that people were talking about afterwards rather than the finish of the thing, the actual finish. I don't know. But you know what they say, Brian? We'll live to fight another day, and that's what we're going to do. Brian, you know what you should never do to a rabbit, white or otherwise? What you should never do to a rabbit? I can't even imagine, no. Don't shave them. Do not shave the little bunny rabbits, I'm telling you. It, it kills their self-esteem, first of all. Secondly, it, it, it takes away a lot of the cuteness of the little bunny. I have a little bunny family living here in the yard, and I see the, the, the big parent of the family running around quite often, and it would just look horrible without hair. But you know what doesn't look bad without hair? What's that? Guys. Have you not guys have hair everywhere? In hair in your nose, hair in your ears, hair in your crotch, hair in your taint, hair around the Hershey Highway, hair springing out of your knuckles, your goddamn kneecaps. There's hair everywhere on the backs of your toes. Well, the tops of your toes, I guess. It would be top and bottom instead of back and front on your... You got hair there, though. Most of you. We're quite a <laughs> repulsive species, as a matter of fact, when you come to think about it. With all this hair growing out of... You know, you know what happens when you got excessive hair growth? No, what's that? That leads at moisture accumulation. Huh. And just like when you put a mulch bed around a tree... That's to keep the moisture in to feed the roots of the tree. The problem is, 
the hydraulics and the mechanics and the biology and the and the crapology of of men does not work like that. The more moisture you have around the trunk of the tree, it doesn't make that tree grow any bigger once you reach a certain age of mature maturity. Is what I'm trying to say. So the whole thing is, we're a fucking mess. And and summer is is over now, and fall is here. It is time to clean out the clutter. And that's why our friends at Manscaped can help because they manufacture something to either eliminate or remove the hair or make the hair that you have smell better or make the places that you've removed all that swamp rot clutter smell better and feel better and, and, and are slicker. You don't want friction down there either, Brian. You don't really want friction on any part of your body. That can lead to to matte burns and things of that. You don't want matte burns on your taint, do you? Have you ever had a matte burn on your taint, Brian? I don't think I've ever been burnt on my uh, taint, as you put it, no. Well, it taint pleasant, I'll tell you that. But folks, at Manscaped, they know what you can do for the fall. It's fresh ball fall, and that's why they've got the Platinum Package 4.0. The Lawnmower 4.0 Body Trimmer, our favorite ever personal grooming product in the history of personal grooming products they go all the way back geez 70 or 80 years now boy can you imagine what a stinky fucking place the old west was try to go to a, one of those whore houses in the old west nobody shaved their shit back then it wasn't until the 70s that we got with the program so the lawnmower 4.0 body trimmer the weed whacker nose and ear hair trimmer where you get all the hair out of your ears so you can stick the Raycon premium wireless earbuds in there. <laughs> well, you and, can't just combine the plugs. What are you doing? Well, they're friends of ours, too. And then you got to get the hair out of your nose because that way you can smell bullshit when it's being served up to you. Because there's a lot of people in this country whose bullshit detectors have gone south on them and they don't even know it. Then you can upgrade your shower routine with the Ultra <laughs> P premium body wash and the Ultra premium two-in-one shampoo and conditioner. So it'll make the rough stuff slick. It'll make the stinky stuff smell good. It'll make your knees freeze and your liver quiver. Then the ultra premium deodorant that's aluminum free, or as we say across the pond, aluminium. And they also throw in the crop preserver ball deodorant and the crop reviver ball toner. You always need to tone your balls. Brian, every time you go to the gym, you get on the ball machine, you want to tone those balls up. The Crop Reviver does it without even having to stretch them and put those hooks in. And they'll throw in two free gifts to the Platinum Package 4.0, the Manscaped Boxers and the Shed Travel Bag that are both specifically made to hold your goodies. So right now, go to manscaped.com and get 20% off and free shipping with the code DRIVE. It ought to be the code Smell Good instead of your stinky ass smelling now like a man eating from under cheese in a septic tank of a slaughterhouse. Well, that's quite a long code. How's someone going to do that? Well, just say the code is your stinky balls will smell better and not like a man eating from under cheese in a septic tank of a slaughterhouse. Who can't remember that? Who can't spell that's 20, that? 20 per, well, that's not my fault you're illiterate. 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com when you use the code DRIVE. And for the record, I'm literate. Well, I'm a Methodist. That doesn't mean anything. You're a meth head. I didn't say that. That's not what you I, said. I went through the program. <laughs> anyway, speaking of programs, what are you doing while I'm shaving my crotch? What are you doing over there on the Arcadian Vanguard Network and the Wrestling News? Oh, another action-packed week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Of course, get information about all the shows on Twitter at Super Podcasts or on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few notes. As you just mentioned, Jim, the wrestling news. Are you tired of wrestling news with spin? With bias? Guys getting phone calls from, I don't know, let's say Chris Jericho, and then they just repeat what he wants? Are you tired of that? Because some other people are too. We oh, are yeah, too. I, was, that a, was that a question to me? I'm, I've been tired of it. Well, of course, we have a solution, and that is the wrestling news. Free, daily, morning wrestling newscast with no opinion, no conjecture, no star ratings, just actual wrestling news. Check it out today at thewrestlingnews.com. 
Or, of course, access it wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Look for Arcadian Vanguard's The Wrestling News. And, of course, I want to mention a couple of other things. The latest Patreon episode of Breaking Kayfabe with Baldrin and Barry is out right now. Patreon.com slash Baldrin and Barry. Alan Blackstock returns to the show to speak about UK wrestling history. Check it out once again. Patreon.com slash Baldrin and Barry. And check out Breaking Kayfabe with Baldrin and Barry wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And, of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Membership! My house guests have no idea what's going on. Go through the archives today at 605pod.com. Available wherever you find your favorite podcast. Won't scream a second time. The Mothership. So one of the things that the wrestling news covered over the past few days is I'm sure the big announcement that thankfully the wrestling gods have smiled on everyone and we are going to be able to see on a regular basis for the next five years on our televisions, if AEW lasts that long, Plumber Moxley. He's re-signed and, and he's he's back and he's 10 pounds heavier and he's learned a new hold and he's going to have an even more important position molding the young minds of professional wrestling. Is this what I'm hearing? This is what you're hearing, and this is the news. The wrestling news did cover it this past week. I'm actually going to pull up the official statement here because Tony Khan and AEW put out a press release <clears throat> announcing this. This wasn't something leaked. This was something actually broken by AEW. No, it was broken, all right. Before we get to anything else, do you have any issue with the idea of extending John Moxley right now? No, I think he should be extended. I think he should be drawn and quartered. I'd put, I'd put him on the rack and, and stretch him any way we can stretch him. Contractually. No, oh, con- contractually, I'd like to see him banned contractually. Uh, <sighs> read the press release because it writes itself, and then I want to comment on everything. Here it is, Jim. October 7th, 2022. John Moxley signs five-year extension with AEW, expanding roles into mentorship and coaching. AEW CEO. GM and head of creative Tony Khan <laughs> announced that eight and wait as Mama Cornette would say and chief cook and bottle washer announced that AEW World Champion John Moxley has signed a five-year contract extension. This ensures that one of professional wrestling's top stars will remain in all elite wrestling through 2027, while expanding his responsibilities to include mentoring and coaching talent. Moving forward. Moxley will work exclusively for AEW and its international partners, including New Japan Pro Wrestling, where he is a two-time IWGP United States Heavyweight Champion. Moxley has had an incredible run in 2022, most recently recapturing the AEW World Championship at AEW Dynamite Grand Slam against Brian Danielson, pitting the Blackpool Combat Club's top stars against one another for the grandest prize in professional wrestling. He defends the AEW World Championship next against Hangman Adam Page in his hometown of Cincinnati, Ohio on October 18th on a special Tuesday edition of AEW Dynamite live on TBS. Oh, geez. Wait a minute. Remind me of that. I'll need to jot that down. Moxley will kick off the action on tonight's live episode of AEW Rampage, the first night of year four of AEW on TNT at 10 p.m. We have a quote here from Tony Khan. John Moxley is on the best run of his already legendary career, and this five-year extension ensures that he was not only here for AEW's meteoric rise, but also remains a key part... Also remains here for its meteoric fall. (laughs) (laughs) Let me finish. But also remains a key part of the sustained success we're witnessing. Just days after the three-year anniversary show for AEW Dynamite. John is a great world champion for us in his third reign. His wrestling mind is invaluable, and our roster is lucky to have the opportunity to utilize him as a mentor and a coach as we continue to build the stars of today and tomorrow. And finally, a quote from John Moxley here. I love AEW in the spirit of both the company and its fans, said John Moxley. I cherish our shared passion for the sport of professional wrestling. And I'm going to dedicate everything I have in mind, body, and spirit to helping AEW be the best it can going forward. 
Also, I'm going to drink Tony Khan's blood and crack his bones. Some of that may not have been there, but... he has in mind, body, and spirit, and a couple bucks will get you a cup of coffee. Uh, not even at Starbucks these days. Boy, inflation has even hit all the old sayings, right? Before we get to the actual statement, what's in there, and your thoughts on it all, I will say Dave Meltzer, I saw, reported that Moxley was actually not working with a contract for at least a little while now. So their AEW world champion was someone not under contract. Well, of course. Of course he wasn't, because that's never bitten anybody else in the ass. Um, but no, in this case, I'm not questioning Moxley's motives because I, in all honesty, I can't imagine they want his ass back when they've seen what he's been doing lately and what he enjoys doing. And here, here's my comments, a key phrase, I believe in that press release was we'll wrestle exclusively for AEW and it's, how are they phrased? International partners. I, that Tony maybe has finally smartened up, and that's probably what the holdup of the contract was, now that we think about it. Even further is Tony smartened up and realized that this guy is going to work on every garbage show that he can for his jollies. That's what he does. He uses the paycheck that he gets from what is allegedly the second biggest wrestling promotion in, uh, in the... Well, it is... It's allegedly a legitimate wrestling promotion, second biggest wrestling promotion in the country. He uses that check to finance his forays into garbage matches with convicted felons on the indie, not even the legitimate indies, but he likes the garbage matches. That's what he's, if, remember on Dark Side of the Ring, the quote, that he had about the bank-addicted drug robber. Oh, he's fucking great. He likes that shit. He's a mental case. So, as far as the holdup of the contract and that little line about exclusively for us and New Japan and our partners, unless he's going to decide to partner, just full, go full mud show, Tony, and partner with the garbage people, that's what he's trying to prevent. He's got... and. Eh, it was only a matter of time before his champion was going to get hurt. Again, this time it'd be Moxley. Last time it was Punk. Time before I have somebody, whatever, doing that shit. And also it looks like Ned just looks horrible reflecting on the company when there their champion is wallowing around in broken glass and thumbtacks with some fucking, you know, I mean, I... We know, we all know that Nick Gage has something going on mentally. I don't know if he did it to himself because of the drugs he took or whether that was the reason why he chose a life of bank robbing, drug addicting, and fucking garbage wrestling. But he's some type of something. I don't want to insult anybody. Elevator don't go to the top floor. This is Moxley's hero. So, if I was Tony Khan... Yes, I would have never had, and I would have closed that loophole, I would have never had a guy that I was using at the level of John Moxley being allowed to go out and do shit like that. And who knows what kind of fucking headlines those shows are going to make. Guy bleeds out. Guy airlifted to fucking local medical facility before main event featuring TNA, or TNA, before <laughs> AEW world champion. Or some fucking unsavory, felonious predator. Otherwise, then the one that gets all the attention is on the show and makes some headlines. And he was working with the current AEW world champion. So yes, Tony wanted to close that loophole up. But uh, I don't argue, besides five years, how old is Moxley? Uh, let me look that up. Well, he's in. He's got to be in his late thirties, and he looks older because of the balding plumber gimmick he's got going on. Thirty-six. Okay, so he'll be there till he's forty-one with all the shit that he's doing and and continues to do. But nevertheless, if I was Tony, I wouldn't be signing a guy like that to five years. But that's probably what he was strong-armed into doing to get Moxley to give up the garbage matches and the and the indie shows. So he probably, oh, I've got to have him. I can't lose someone else. 
everybody I've got's hurt or suspended. And so Moxley bends Tony over and says, okay, I won't do my hobby garbage matches. Give me five years and even more money. Okay. Again, I don't have a problem with Tony signing a top guy to a new contract in his current situation. The fans that there that are AEW fans love Plumber Moxley. But I wouldn't have let myself get in a position he's already been in because conveniently, the same time as he as he announces this new contract with Moxley. What did John Moxley do on a pier in Atlantic City over the weekend? He did a job for the bank-addicted drug robber at a garbage show for their garbage title that he also held. And I know some people are going to say the AEW apologists, well, there was outside interference in the match by people that will tie into AEW storylines. Is that is that what they're saying, right? I believe they had Stokely Hathaway and W. Morrissey there representing the firm, MJF's uh, factional retainer, I think it's called, to attack Moxley, leading to him losing to Nick Gage on the pier. And I bet you that Tony had to insist on that because I bet you Moxley just wanted to go and drop their belt back in the time-honored tradition of garbage wrestling on a pier in New Jersey and put the guy over flat in the middle because he's his fucking hero. The bank-addicted drug robber is this guy's hero. Said I'm sure he wanted to do business the right way with the fucking outlaw mud show. While meanwhile, he's the goddamn world champion of a national television promotion. But I'm sure Tony said, oh, we got to have interference to tie into our storyline because he's still a mark. Tony. I don't care whether there's a tie into your storyline or not. When your world champion that you just announced you signed to a brand new five-year contract is doing a job in a garbage match, getting thrown through broken glass and barbed wire and bullshit on a pier in Atlantic City to a convicted fucking felon, you've already jumped the shark on that one. So anyway, the um, mention of coaching and mentoring was interesting yeah. because previous yes. releases they put out were actual positions. You know, this person will be vice president of development and this person will be head of talent relations. This is a very loose. He'll also be coaching and mentoring. How's that different than whatever he does now? Again, this stuff writes itself because, OK, Tony did the right thing. Cost him a lot of money to correct his mistake, but he signed his world champion to a new contract for a longer time, and he can't do garbage shows or indie matches anymore. So he's finally got himself in that spot. And of course, along with it came his champion doing a job on a pier in Atlantic City. But then he has to go further and act like that is not... The setup to a punchline, John Moxley molding young minds in wrestling, mentoring young to what's he going to tell them how to do? Drink blood and grind bones to make bread? <laughs> to make bread. <laughs> I'll grind your bones to make bread, my pretty. I'm going to build a house of your bones. Y yes, and then, and then throw you through the house of your bones. <laughs> and I'm going to crack them. This is a guy who has gone on record as saying he admired the bank-addicted drug robber. This is a guy who is, when he had a well-paying, high-paying network television national promotion job, chose to go wall around with these fucking mutants and the fucking mutants that pay to see that shit for his fucking hobby, and he's going to be teaching young wrestlers. The guy who can't have more than one kind of match, and it sucks because hit the ring from the crowd or the parking lot, go to the floor, use furniture, somebody's going to bleed, defy every goddamn law of gravity, physics, and logic in doing whatever you're going to do, and then rinse and repeat over and over and over. That's exactly where... If I had somebody come up to me and say, 
We're giving you John Moxley in the glory days of OVW. We're giving you John Moxley. What can you teach him? I'd say fucking nothing. It's impossible. We see what we got. This is what he wants to do. So, mentoring or teaching young wrestlers, Hak Patu. Good Lord. It is interesting the changing dynamic backstage right now with Omega and the Bucks being completely out of the picture at the moment. Of course, CM Punk's out of the picture at the moment. It's changed a lot of the makeup behind the scenes. It's changed a lot of the voices that Tony's listening to. I shouldn't say it's changed the voices, but he's listening to the certain voices more than he had before. Well, they're the only voices that's left around, and I didn't think it could get any worse, but apparently it can. Uh, Again, I said it, I'll I'll close this up. I said it the other day, possibly even earlier in this program. I remember saying it, I just don't remember when. People see... Tony, depending on their position, the young wrestlers that just wanted to make a name for themselves in the world, they think he's the greatest booker in the world because he's booking them on television. The veterans see him as an easy, easily manipulated source of a high-paying job where they can kind of do whatever they want. The fucking old-time wrestlers that don't want a job are sitting there looking at what the fuck is going on here. This is embarrassing. The fucking fans think Tony's a baby face up until recently because he was petting and making over all of their favorite wrestlers and treating them fairly until they found out just fairly recently that when you have an environment like that with no leadership and no structure, that sooner or later the whole thing blows up. And now they're starting to boo him because he's taken away all their favorite wrestlers because he couldn't manage them, so he had to suspend them. Ah! That may be a sound effect one of these days on the internet. Ah! Apparently the suspensions aren't going to end anytime soon because the reports are that there's a holdup because someone has threatened legal action and it's kind of a stalemate at the moment. Well, and I'd like to know exactly who's threatening the legal action and what that legal action may be because I bet you I'd probably agree with it, but maybe I wouldn't. Maybe the other ones have decided to... Let's see if maybe, the, what do you think? Maybe Olivier and the Cucamonga kids want to sue Tony for this and take the company away from him because they can run it better than he can. They started the whole thing anyway. I don't know if they have a suit against Tony. Other parties potentially could. But oh, you will. There's a reason why this thing's going to take a while. And again, Meg is tied up in the middle of it. We'll see if anyone figures that part of it out. But Now everybody leave Megan alone. Her name is Mega. But what I was going to say is, all that's happening, there's no end in sight to it. Apparently, Tony just did an interview the other day where people were thinking what he implied was that CM Punk actually was working in a backstage position as an executive, too, although that hasn't been confirmed. AEW right now is, would you, I mean, Moxley just re-signed there. Would you sign that deal if you were him? Because WWE did want him. What? Why? And they're going to bring in, uh, the rumor is they're going to bring in his wife now as a commentator in AEW or as an announcer or interview or whatever she does well well the the hardly boy's wife's got a job right so why shouldn't everybody if you're related go ahead and hop on but uh, wwe wanted him back yeah i don't think he wants to go back to wwe because he didn't like it there because he couldn't bleed and do all of his shit and i think the only reason they wanted him back after they've seen if they indeed did did you hear this from reliable source i mean i've heard that they wanted would him they back. want him back or they just not want fucking tony to have well either way i mean i don't don't think there's any difference in their mindset about that but you know one last thing i want to say you brought up the nick gage factor and the things that he said about him you know i've seen moxley i saw him throughout his wwe career saw him in the shield saw him in developmental clips of his stuff on the indies before that he was never the version of moxley we have now it's almost like i'm not going to use the word cosplay he's not cosplay nick gage but it's almost like That wrestler that he admires so much (laughs) has had a major part of the character of John Moxley now, because he was never like this before. So I actually think there's a big tribute to Nick Gage and the entire Moxley persona on camera. I could have given Moxley a pass if when he came back from rehab, he started actually being a pro wrestler instead of the fucking deathmatch king of drinking blood and breaking bones. 
But if that didn't change him, I don't think anything will. Well, he's certainly staying with AEW. He, he had the chance to blame what he had done in the ring up till then in AEW on substance abuse. He did not choose to take that. Well, we'll see how his coaching career goes from this point forward. But, Jim, he is remaining with AEW, and WWE had Extreme Rules, and it closed with a big return. But why don't we talk about Extreme Rules here on your show, well, which I've somehow commandeered. Yes, I was about to say, you're just taking and running off with it, for heaven's sake. I'm I'm the one that's fucking this dog. You're just the head holder, Brian Last. I've left the room. But, I'll, well, I'll have you know I need to get started also because I've got to, the Monroe brothers are digging a trench in a neighbor's yard, and I've, I need to supervise that. It's going to be two courses and a cap. Two courses and a cap. I don't know what that means. The retaining wall. Around the oak tree back there, between me and on the property line, between me and my neighbor, I'm I'm decorating that for a to be a nice neighbor, and and they're they're putting in two courses and a cap. That's a stonemason's version of two turntables and a microphone. All right, well let's talk about all right. Well, anyway, as I mentioned earlier, we're we're gonna we're gonna hop off for just a, a few scant seconds. You'll never really know we're gone, and and magically, it's gonna be the next day, and extreme rules will have happened, and we'll talk about that after this brief musical interlude. Okay, we are back, and extreme rules is over with. Thank God. G. Manelli Shelley. G. Manelli Shelley. Uh, br- uh, you know what? The best thing for me was the cold open. I love Heyman. Uh, just anything that he does as a performer. Wasn't a fan of his wrestling promotion. But anything he does, he did the voiceover explaining the meaning of, of extreme to young Sheldon or whoever that kid was there. And that was the best part of the show. It went downhill from there for me. Because <sighs> extreme rules. I mean, obviously we saw them promoting the matches and it's named extreme, but it didn't hit me until I tried to watch this, what it would be like if you just did <laughs> Big budget outlaw garbage wrestling for three hours straight. And it's mind numbing. I don't know what, if, if anybody, if anybody in that company had the ability to transport themselves of 20 years ago, Triple H or even Stephanie or, or anybody that's been there that long, right? And they had the ability to take themselves from the Attitude Era and transport themselves and just sit down and watch one WWE pay-per-view event, premium live event, big show, whatever they want to call them. They would be mortified and aghast at what they had fucking spawned. This violated every rule of wrestling that not only Vince McMahon, and I know a lot of people who've known and seen Vince's output over the last 10 or more years will just think, oh my God, but Vince McMahon used to know how to fucking put a wrestling show together in terms of building matches, making stars, not being ridiculously over the top with shit to the point where you couldn't follow it. All those just little rules of thumb. And this was just, there was nothing else you could do to the human body by the time you got finished with this. And it didn't even feature any of their major stars, Roman Reigns, Brock Lesnar, Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar. Are there any other major stars in wrestling these days? CM Punk. Well, he's not in wrestling these days. Tony fixed that. Put him in with a bunch of children. Anyway, the matches <laughs> had obviously every single one of them had extreme rules, but you couldn't really tell the difference because they all blended together because they all basically, except for the last one, did the same thing. 
The only match that didn't have furniture was the last match. The only match didn't have outside interference was the last match. I mean, I could go on, but we will in in brief uh, chronological order. Um, I didn't think that I, it could ever be boring to me to watch Gunther work. But this took it away, uh, my guilty pleasure of, of wrestling these days, because in a match like this, there's no working. It's anybody can do this shit. The Donnybrook match, Gunther and Kaiser and Vinci, two Germans and a fucking Italian, against Seamus and Ridge and Butch. And Seamus and Gunther have had an a excellent pay-per-view match last month and a real good uh tv match the night before but now it's set uh, there are wooden barrels around ringside and wooden stools around ringside and an old-fashioned antique mahogany bar and so they <laughs> In street fights in the territory days, or in no rules matches like this, they didn't set them up to be visually ridiculous and phony. Guys used furniture that was around the ring, the timekeeper's table, the chair, the bell, fucking toolbox from under the ring, rope poles that held the you know barrier ropes up, guardrail, what but this is just visually ridiculous from the start. And they it's all six-way. There's no tags. There's no disqualification. There's no rules. They go 100 miles an hour, yet it, it's not new. Jump starting at, uh, at 100 miles an hour, a grudge match. But when you have to go 20-something minutes and all six in the ring... And there's obviously this these visually ridiculous props and shillelaghs around. Then it just, it was like a 20-minute long angle that would not end. And they're beating the shit out of each other. They're beating the shit out of each other. They barely used the ring. The furniture was the star of the match. At a point or two, people chanted, we want tables. Butch did a moonsault off of a barrel. This is the first match. And finally, Sheamus gave Gunther a razor's edge through the announce desk and left him laying there, and they beat Vinci one, two, three. And, of course, Philadelphia loved it because they've been watching this shit for 30 years, but it was 25 minutes into the show before this was over. Everybody involved could have been hurt. And it was just... It just, it just was there. It just happened. It's the same shit you see from every wrestling promotion way too often, and now they're doing every match on a show like this. Help me, Brian, explain this to me. Well, there's not too much I could add to what you said. I agree with most of it. The crowd was hotter for this match than I thought they would be, but it was the opening match on the show. Nothing uncommon from what we see on both shows regularly. My only other thought is, and I know I'm in the minority, while the name Butch may not have been good, I enjoyed his outfit as Butch more than him dressing like... He looks like fucking Jackie Earl Haley and breaking away. You know, like he doesn't look like... As badass as he did as Butch with the little cap on. I don't know. Maybe I'm the only one who thinks that, but... I think you are. He's gone back to this, like, sea monster look, and I don't like it. I don't like I'd, it. Well, I didn't... I don't think a street urchin from a Dickens novel was doing him any favors either, but... um. So, and, I, and I'm not trying to just bury all this shit. I'd like to like more than I like, but I, I'm sorry. I've been watching, doing, loving, booking performing it's at all this shit for 40 years and i just see guys out there hastening themselves into an early wheelchair for goddamn no earthly reason because nobody gives a shit anymore because this is not unusual the reason why all this shit used to get over is because it was unusual now it's expected and not necessarily welcomed anyway for one of the women's titles, Extreme Rules, 
lazy booking. Ronda Rousey versus Liv Morgan. A goddamn... I can't wait to hear what you're going to say about this match. This is an inmate from a women's prison against a Girl Scout. And the Girl Scout brings a baseball bat out and leans it in the corner. And then try, they're, they're facing each other, and she tries to go for it, old Liv Morgan. And Rhonda stops her. But 15 seconds later, she gets the bat anyway, and Rhonda just takes it away from her and tosses it out of the ring. So the baby face in this equation is trying to use a baseball bat against the heel, but the heel keeps taking it away from her and throwing it away. But God, I, w- I want to take drugs. I want a new drug, one that won't make me watch wrestling. Which drug is that? Whatever drugs these people are fucking taking. <laughs> um. So anyway, then <laughs> Rhonda beats up Liv for a while, and Liv was under the ring and came out under the apron skirt as well and came out and did the fire extinguisher spot, but she almost missed that because she started squirting the extinguisher while it was still underneath the apron skirt. And every time Rhonda did something to her, the judo throws, or she gave her a piper's pit at one point on the floor, Morgan just jumps right back up. Finally, Rousey gets the bat and hits six shots with a baseball bat on Liv. Now, they looked like shit. You couldn't tell whether she was trying to working hit her hard and couldn't or was just taunting her with the bat by not hitting her that hard. But Liv Morgan rolls in the ring after getting hit with a bat six times, starts comeback. And then Liv gets the bat and hits Ronda Rousey with it nine times. A 120-pound blonde Barbie just hit Ronda Rousey nine times with a baseball bat, but fortunately she couldn't do any damage because Ronda just went and got her judo gi belt and whipped Morgan with that, and Morgan sold the the gi belt more than she sold the baseball bat. And then Ronda got the bat again and hit Liv Morgan another five times. And Liv Morgan just posted Rousey to stop her from beating her with the baseball bat. And by now they've they've started just swinging it so effortlessly, you can tell also it's a fucking wiffle ball bat anyway, because there's no weight to it. And then Morgan goes and pulls a table out from under the ring, and I say, you know what? Life is too short. I'm done. What happened? Where, Where did they go from there? Now that all the children have grown up. And how can they face their time knowing nobody gives them? All right. Well, Rhonda eventually tapped her out. Or not tapped her out. The referee called it because Liv passed out while slightly smiling (laughs) as Rhonda destroyed her. Rhonda looked pretty good in the finish. Rhonda looked good at the end. And I like Rhonda as a heel a whole lot more than anything else they've done. Of course, the first thing I see on Twitter is a picture of her. Biggest smile ever holding the belt. (laughs) It says new (laughs) world champion. But um, I... I like Ronda going over, and I know a lot of the fans like Liv Morgan, not as many as people may think, but this was the right decision. Ronda should be one of the women's champions as well, a heel. Of course it's the right decision. Ronda Rousey should beat Liv Morgan. My God, it's the right decision in anybody's universe. It shouldn't even have been a match. It's fucking ridiculous. But the question is, she, she beats her after she's hit her with a baseball bat about 17 times? Hey, what? Have What'd you think of the bat? Was it a rubber bat? Minds. Yes, I just it 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 wasn't a wiffle ball bat because actually that's so light that it would have bounced around on the mat, but it was obviously a gimmick baseball bat because of the way that they were not only hitting each other with it and it would make a little noise, but also because of the way that they were just with one hand and drawing back and flicking the wrist and waving it around. It wasn't a real fucking bat, but that's the point. What lunatic would think that you can hit Liv Morgan with a baseball bat more than once and she's going to live to fight another day? It's They had the girls using baseball bats. So I invoked Eddie Graham's 
Booking rule number 474. You don't have to watch any matches all the way through where the girls are using baseball bats and not selling it. Would you like to talk about the strap match? It's another winner. Let's go to that. Well, let's. I'll say one thing about the strap match. Just like the previous match, the star of the match was a woman. Yes. And, and boy, she made sure she didn't miss the pepper spray because she missed the fucking fireball. Right? <laughs> if, she, she waterboarded him with the fucking pepper spray. If that had been goddamn water, he would have drowned. All right, we'll, we'll get there, folks. Um, so it's Karrion Cross and Drew McIntyre. They and they want Karrion Cross and Scarlett to be a, a star, stars to be on top, main event talent. And they're pushing them big. And I'm trying to get because they look great. And they got the entrance and the whole nine yards. But you can't tell in any of these matches on this show whether anybody can really work or not because there wasn't any. There was no long sustained exhibition of can you work or not it was just the endless gimmicks but obviously neither one of these guys have had any or if any very many strap matches they don't do them a lot anymore and obviously the rules of a strap match in the wwe are still well the pinfall wins it you're just strapped together so they do that but Cross attacked McIntyre before the strap was attached. And they have a 15-second fight in the ring, and they go to the floor, and they go over the barricade, and they go out into the arena, and he's, you know, they're fighting. The, but the bell has not rung to start the match. Here's another thing. They've just had girls in a legally sanctioned match beating shit out of each other with baseball bats. They just had six guys whacking each other with stools and bars and whatever the fuck. And this is a strap match with apparently no rules, except whoever gets pinned is the the winner, the loser. But it's important they mention the bell is not rung to start the match while they're fighting in the fucking bleachers. I And I have seen a hundred strap matches at least i'm sure i've never seen any of them ever go over the barricade and out fighting in the arena number one because the heel would have been stabbed number two because that's putting a hat on a hat so they have a long fight on the floor and finally they roll in the ring and mcintyre then attaches the strap to carry and cross and then the bell rings to start the match after they've been fighting out in the fucking arena and they start having a strap match where McIntyre is whipping carrying Cross, and they go back out to the floor. <laughs> and Cross takes over on the floor, and he whips the shit out of McIntyre, and they go back in the ring finally. And they go on, and finally McIntyre makes a big comeback, and they did an extended one-two with, you know, forearms and punches and blows and trading whips. And and that was, the people are into it because they showed emotion and passion and they were working hard. Again, it, it, I'm not even complaining about the talent. It's just the preposterous bullshit that they're put into with these matches and the the phoniness of them and the fact that it doesn't make sense and et cetera. Anyway, so he goes for the Claymore kick and Scarlet is there to block him off and pulls out <sighs> pulls out the spray and sprays him in the eyes. <clears throat> now here is one one problem. And they could have called me. I've done this a million times. Actually, both in angles and in real life. We remember the pepper spray story from long ago. The announcers, as soon as she sprays. Drew McIntyre, the announcer. Oh my God, is that pepper spray? Well, you just, that's the first thing you thought of, right? And then I guess somebody told him in the goddamn headset, you, you fucking blown it. You should have said, what is that? And so they, they had the announcer say that they went over and got the spray afterwards. And it is 
law enforcement grade pepper spray. Here's the deal. Every girl in wrestling going back to Ma Bass has pulled something out of her purse and, and used it. And Tammy in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, this was her thing. And Sin in OVW, this was her thing. What do women carry in their purse? Tampons. Well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, they, they obviously make up products, obviously fucking you know, keys, you know, et cetera, like that. But also if they want to protect themselves, mace, that's been going on for 50 years. You have a, a lot of women carry a little thing of mace or pepper spray in their, in their purse. So it's believable when a woman is ringside with a purse, she would either come out powder can be makeup or a little thing of fucking mace or pepper spray. And what we used to use with Tammy and, and Stacy was they'd get the the little feminine hygiene spray, travel size, and we'd put tape around it so you couldn't see what it was. And that way, you know, the guys, not only did they not get fucking blinded, but also they'd smell nice. But the, the thing is, the way that the announcers are supposed to sell it is if that's pepper spray and you're at ringside, it will waft over to you enough to, to know what it is, definitely, even if it doesn't get in your eyes. That's why we used to, with the ether, we actually used an ether-based compound spray so that when you sprayed it, the fans would smell that it was ether. Well, you can't do that with real pepper spray, but you don't have to have the announcers fucking jump the gun on it because that stooges the whole thing off. How did they know exactly what it was that quick? And also, not only if you sprayed that much pepper spray in, in a fucking guy's face, would it potentially could blind him legitimately, but also it would, it would have gassed the first three rows. Everybody would have been running out of there if that was legitimate pepper spray because of that amount in the air. And most people sitting there would know that. You've been pepper sprayed, hadn't you, Brian? I've never been pepper sprayed, no. It ain't fucking fun. And here's another thing. Then they go back and they show the, the um, not only is McIntyre's face not red, not blistered, because that much pepper spray, you, it, it, his skin would be bubbling at that point and definitely be inflamed, but the referee's pouring water at his face, which is like throwing gasoline on a fire with peppers. It's milk. You need milk. But anyway, she sprays pepper spray in McIntyre's face in front of the referee. And he's blind and cross wins one, two, three, a pinfall and a strap match. It's bad also, and this will be a recurring theme that we'll talk about later on. You don't do shit like that in front of the referee, even in a no DQ match, because then the heat goes on the referee, because visually the people are seeing the representative of the promotion do absolutely dick all of shit about something that's fucking their hero over. And that's who they get mad at. No DQ match or not, a raw fuck has to be done behind the referee's back, or elsewise it does nothing for anybody except make the people disgusted with the promotion. And we'll revisit that later on. Uh, thoughts I missed on this contest, Brian? Not too much, and I don't think this is the pay-per-view nor the match for me to justify going along with the review. So I'll just say, like I said at the beginning, I think Scarlett was kind of the star of the match because the match itself wasn't put together in the greatest way. I'm starting to agree with you that Karrion Cross should maybe shave his head again or lose his hair in a match maybe more appropriately. He looks too fuzzy and friendly like that, doesn't he? It was kind of like maybe there was too much gel and it was standing up. But by the end of it, it was kind of like neatly standing up. Uh, those are my only thoughts on this. They, uh, they certainly, when it comes to the spooky wrestling, their entrance is one of the best. Great entrance. It certainly is. And my hair was standing up at the end too, but because of fright. All right. The other women's championship match was decided in a ladder match with Bianca and Bailey. And the first 30 seconds, they had two ladders in the ring already. And this wasn't Shawn Michaels and Razor Ramon. 
and I got distracted because again, I like Bailey and I liked Bianca. She's heck of an athlete. You can't tell what anybody can do in this, in a ladder match. And you're not going to really see anything that makes any sense anymore. <laughs> Michaels and Razor did it. They should have left it there. So Bianca won. I'm still waiting for Bailey to have an actual wrestling match against a top main event girl, which Bianca is, but this yeah. wasn't an actual wrestling match. Yeah, Bianca definitely is. And I'll watch that. So if if this had, if they'd stayed on the ground, I would have been interested in this because nobody else was. But that's what happened. Yeah, I wish it wasn't a ladder match just because... I don't know. Again, it was all match. The, the whole gimmick of the pay-per-view was nothing but gimmick matches, but I'll say Bianca may be my favorite currently in WWE in regular matches, not in this kind of match, but I think Bianca, she's proven herself. She's a main eventer. She's a top-tier female worker. Bianca's one of my very favorite. Very favorites, I should say. <laughs> Keep them out of ladder matches. All righty. I quit match. Edge versus Finn Balor. You know what the first thing was that I wrote down, Brian? What's that? The the first match with a semblance of a wrestling match. Boy, would that come back to haunt me. I thought they were, it's an I quit match, and they've had multiple furniture matches. I thought it's Edge, it's Balor, two pros, two technicians. They're going to work. It's going to be man-to-man, hand-to-hand. There's going to be... No furniture, no ha-ha, two pros. Even though they have absolutely nothing left to do that people have not already seen, including 100-pound blonde girls having baseball bat fights, now they're giving them a wrestling match. And I was into this. And, uh, you know, the, the referee working the microphone and Edge saying, get that out of my face, and... Balor in the ring, it's just, it's the way he's been used and he was beaten for so long and marginalized, but in the ring, he's fantastic. And he got vicious as a heel. And, you know, this started in the ring and they wrestled and then it got more violent as they went. So then when they went to the floor, it wasn't egregious when he's bouncing him off the announce desk. And they busted through the barricade and fought out on the floor, which is, again, great, but we've seen it already tonight. Not their fault. It's the creative team's fault. But when they got to the kickoff show set and Edge got a hockey stick and got a cross face on Finn Balor on the kickoff show set with the, you know, the hockey stick in his mouth, I started losing interest. Cause I no, here they go now. God damn it. And then they went up the bleachers and they were in the stands and into the breezeway and then back down the stairs and it's taken forever. And they lost to do that old bullshit Philadelphia ECW fighting the crowd shit and risk a lawsuit. They lost their momentum and lost the semblance of this being a wrestling match. Because when you get in a real fight, or even a fake fight, what's the reason for walking up and down the same set of stairs while a guy's fighting you up and down? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah I, I thought. Know. Yeah. So anyway... Then they get back in the ring and Finn starts beating Edge over and over with a chair. And I skipped ahead. And where I landed, because of course I'm watching on that bullshit streaming TV with no real remote and no on-screen fast forward. So I landed where Edge had Finn Balor in a submission and Priest in front of the referee, just comes out and jumps in the ring, and Edge beats him up and spears him through the ropes onto, or no, beat him up and then speared Balor off the apron through the ropes onto Dom Mysterio and Damian Priest. And then there's Rhea Ripley and handcuffs Edge to the top rope, all in front of the referee. Remember what we said just a scant few minutes ago about the previous match? 
I don't care if it's no rules. I don't care if it's anything goes. When shit like this is just blatantly done in front of the referee who stands there with his tiny dick in his little hand and does jack all of shit about it, then it just makes people mad at the promotion. It makes people mad at the referee. It kills any credibility for anything you ever try to do. It's obviously just fake and phony and bullshit. And all three heels just beat Edge up in front of the referee. And then Balor brings in two kendo sticks because one's not enough. And they beat on Edge. And the heels told the referee to back off, and he did. And then they play music. And here comes Rey Mysterio. And he makes a comeback in a match that he's not in. And then Dominic <laughs> attacks Ray, his father, from behind and beats him up on the floor. By the way, parenthetically, the match is still officially going on. And Edge is still handcuffed and he gets more kendo sticked. And then here comes Beth Phoenix, Edge's wife. I love Beth. And she looks great. But she grabs the stick and wears out all the heels. Hey, you know what? That would have been a great afterbirth for a match that had already concluded. But in front of the referee who's still watching all this, all these other people are just doing all this shit. So she wears out the heels, and then there's Beth and Rhea Ripley, and Philly loves that because this is ECW shit in Philadelphia. And that's not a compliment from me, but those people like it. And I'd love to see Beth and Rhea. In an angle. This is what this was. The only problem is they're having an angle in the middle of a match. So Beth and Rhea Ripley fight, and Beth spears her and gets the key and unlocks Edge. And Edge spears Priest and kicks Dominic in the nuts and spears Ballard three times and then tells Beth to get a chair and then gets the support bar off the chair and cross faces Finn Balor with the fucking bar in his mouth, but Ripley gets brass knucks and knocks Beth Phoenix out. And Priest choke slams Edge. Remember, this is a single match now between Edge and Finn. Priest choke slams Edge. Balor gives Edge three double stomps off the top rope. But he still won't quit. So since Beth is laying there unconscious, Rhea Ripley gets two chairs and is going to concerto Beth Phoenix. So Edge quits. And then Rhea Ripley does it anyway. And the same as every other concerto, no blood splatters, no brain matter flies out of the ears. So we know that she just hit the other chair because it's fake. With, with, by the way, not a lot of margin for error, so why the fuck would somebody want to lay there and potentially risk brain damage for somebody to do something to them that all the fans know is fake and how it works? And Michael Cole screams, where are the damn doctors? Where are the police? Where's the security? Where's the booker? Let's string him up by his fucking nuts. Oh, I forgot they don't have one. They got 30. It took 30 people to write this shit. That's the first time I've ever seen an angle go our Broadway, Brian. Well, I'm glad you watched it. When I saw that it was going to be Edge versus Finn Balor and I'd watched the rest of the show, I decided to say I quit. <laughs> and I did not watch this match, but I saw the post-match and... Eh, I mean... That's all I could say. Eh, I give this an eh. In any territory in wrestling history, the fans would have rioted and burned the ring over this finish. Not heat on the heels, heat on the promotion. That, that would have been a town killer in, in the territory. They were, how in the world are these heels being allowed to do this? There's the referee doing nothing. This fucking wrestling promotion sucks. That shouldn't have been allowed. I'm not coming back and giving them any more of my money if they didn't set the seats on fire first. So the main event, are you ready? Yeah. Yeah, the fight pit. Seth Rollins versus Matt Riddle with special referee 
former UFC great Daniel Cormier. And honestly, after the previous match, I was going to just say fuck it because I'd forgotten what the main event was, right? <laughs> I was just going to turn it off. But I see the fight pit. I said they won't be able to bring furniture into this cage. Certainly to God, maybe Cormier is going to have some involvement. Maybe we'll, you know, we'll get something out of this, whatever, right? Man to man and do some kind of thing to bring a former UFC champion into the end of the deal. Well, it, Cormier was, they established early that he would get physical with each guy, pulling him off, telling him, hey, you're not here to fight me, you're here to fight him. You know, not taking any bullshit, right? That's exactly what they should have done. I hate how modern guys just go down and curl up in a ball and cover up and guys on top just throw fake punches at their arms. I, it, Bobby Eaton hated guys that would cover up. He actually considered it a personal insult. If he's going to throw a punch, a kick, whatever at you, and you're flinching and you're covering up, it's going to make his shit look bad. It's not going to connect. It's not going to look good. It also means that you don't trust him. And Bobby never hurt anybody. And that's another way that you can get hurt. Covering up when a guy is going to drop something on you or throwing punches or whatever, and you're throwing your hands up, Guy's elbow drop drives your forearm into your fucking nose, breaks your own nose. It just, it, anyway. So, and apparently we found out eye gouging is legal in the fight pit. So, they had a cage match. And that would have been great. And it, it was good. And this was the, the kind of the most wrestling match like thing on a show all night. But if they people hadn't seen five previous garbage matches, a cage match would have stood out more. And also, no blood in any of these matches, including a cage match, which almost calls for it. So they they want guys out there bashing each other over the head with chairs, throwing each other through furniture, whipping each other with belts and straps, all this other chaos, baseball bats, but no blood. No blood in an athletic contest between two guys hand to hand. Why that would just that would just be horrible. The work was fine in this. Seth Rollins is one of the best workers in the WWE. And this is Riddle's environment where he can do MMA influence shit, and it that's his strong point if he has one. And then they went up and fought on the platform for a while. But again, they're up on the platform and the fans are singing the Heels song. Oh, 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 or what is that? How do they, what, what is Seth Rollins' tune? I'm the, oh, 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 but it's, that's not it. No, that's not it. Well, it's, it's something like that. Anything with that. Wrestling fans love anything. Oh, 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 oh. they love that shit. Well, then we find out that you can't be counted down, which is the only way to win this thing, is to be counted down to the count of 10 or submit. Can't be counted down on the platform, just in the ring. And so they get back down in the ring. Um, it, it, well, <laughs> Why do people think that the Territory Days wrestling matches were 15-minute long headlocks? And they think, like, oh, Cornette wants to go back where it was a 15-minute headlock. When they're actually weren't maybe in a Johnny Valentine match when he was pissed at the people, but they don't mind today when they do a big spot and then nothing happens for three solid minutes while they're setting up the next big spot. That's okay. But in the old days when they actually used holds for, I don't know, part of the match, but it continued moving pretty much from beginning to end. That was boring. But one big thing, and then everybody lays around for three minutes and figures out how to put the furniture back together. That's not boring. So Riddle hits sin hits Centon. Riddle hits Seth with a Centon. 
off the platform and both of them sold it for about three replays. And then after a long time, both of them get up and Riddle jumps up and grabs a triangle on Rollins. But Rollins has him and he power, he, he picks him up and kind of buckle bombs him into the cage, but Riddle's hang on, hanging on. And then he power bombed him in the ring twice, but Riddle hold on, held on. And then after 10 seconds where they're just there immobile, Rollins taps and you can barely even see the tap on camera. And that was it. The finish, all that that they did all through this whole thing. And the finish was both out of nowhere and flat. And it, this is the ultimate example of nobody builds a finish to the big pop anymore. They just do it when they run out of shit to do. I thought the other fight pit matches were better. And maybe part of that was, I know this sounds weird. I thought maybe it worked better in an empty room than it did with the fans there. I think it does. Because they've, they're they tempted to do bigger things, which they have to sell longer. And then it just drags on for fucking ever. And also, I mean, let's face it, Timothy Thatcher and Matt Riddle, Thatcher, that was his gimmick too, is wrestling and joint manipulation and holds and et cetera. If this had been a regular wrestling cage match, Ric Flair versus fucking Magnum TA or whatever, that, you know, yeah, that's that's fine too with these two guys. But they try to mix up all of their metaphors and it just, and it goes so long. So anyway. It went long. But that wasn't the end, and of course, at the very end, we saw Matt Riddle and Daniel Cormier leaving. They were in the entranceway, and that's when the lights went out. The lights went out. That's the night that the lights went out in Philly. That's the night that they brought back a guilty man. So, I'm going to wait again to see if. As somebody said, Bray Wyatt had done an interview where he said, or the story got out, that he wasn't in full agreement with a lot of the creative. Maybe he didn't want to be set on fire, have a can of gasoline poured on him and have him set on fire and burned on pay-per-view. That was a novel way of giving somebody their notice. Maybe he didn't like all the goofy bullshit. Or maybe we'll find out he was behind all the goofy bullshit that spawned the the living puppets in the Firefly Funhouse and Alexa Bliss and her black vomit and whatever the fuck all that other shit was going on. The people love him. I don't know what this has to do with wrestling. The blackout happens and you hear he's singing, Bray Wyatt's singing. He's got the whole world in his hands. But it goes on for a while because as the song is being sung, they go to different spots in the arena with a spotlight and you see there's a pig and there's a buzzard. Well, a and pig man and a buzzard man. Well, yes, to be clear. with the masks on, a, a person with a pig mask and a person with a buzzard. And I think there was an anteater. I don't know what he was and something else. And all of the Firefly Funhouse Shit, I'm afraid this is going to lead to more teleportation. I can smell teleportation coming a mile away. Yeah. And then there's the fiend, and he's not burned at ringside. And there's then they see a door, but it's not the real fiend. It's just a dressed-up fiend. And then there's a door that goes to a spooky old house video, and there's audio clips of the goofy hee promos and. Then a blackout again, or no, the door opened, and then it blacked out again, and then out came the masked guy with the lantern, and then he takes off the mask, and it's Bray Wyatt, and gets a huge pop. And I guess Philadelphia, again, would be the place where anybody would want to see anything loony in wrestling. But maybe there's a good horror movie in this gimmick. I don't know. but. I just, I don't see what the fuck when you've got 
the the baby faces in this equation, and I guess now he is a baby face because people love him. But when you've got a supernatural guy with living puppets that invade the baby faces fucking spaces, and they've got to act like that they are legitimately concerned about the animal puppets and the you know presto the magic clown fucking kid show set and the I I I I just I don't. I've short-circuited. Well, it's been a good week for John Moxley because he got this contract renewal from AEW, and also he is no longer my least favorite active wrestler because <laughs> Bray Wyatt is back. Look, his early iteration with Luke Harper and um, Eric Rowan when he had the swamp cult leader thing going, that was all right. Great entrance. But the last several years were rough. And if you're someone who does not like spooky wrestling or spiritual natural, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? <laughs> spiritual natural. Hey, that's a Dusty Rhodes. Yeah. Spiritual natural, baby. He's spiritual natural. Supernatural. But supernatural, thank you. If you don't like any of those things, the cinematic matches, just the bad segments that couldn't exist in the real world, this guy's the king of it. And, you know, a lot of people said a lot of it was Vince. I don't think it started with Vince. I think this guy had stuff he wanted to do, and Vince was like, oh, let me expand my ideas on this crazy fucking stuff. I don't look forward to any of this, and people pop for anyone that returns, but he's also a guy that was over. It's just his matches sucked. I'm not looking forward to this at all. Well... There was Extreme Rules, AK. You know what? Next year, just come out and do it. WWE Premium Live Event, lazy booking. Just go ahead and do it. I was hoping the White Rabbit would have been revealed to be Grace Slick. That would have been amazing. It would have. I bet she could still belt one out after all these years. Was he the White Rabbit? Was there a rabbit? Of all those wacky human creatures wearing the masks that they were... Well, that was my favorite thing, too, because they would zoom in on the person with the pig mask, and you see them just standing there amongst the people. Yeah. And then they would turn the lights off, but you could still see him for a second before he obviously had to turn around and run away. <laughs> <laughs> and then at one point, they showed the camera on, I think, Cole and Corey Graves, and they so somehow they didn't notice the mask that was put right in front of them. Yes, there was a mask sitting on the announcer's desk, and when the camera got to him, suddenly they looked up, oh, how did that get here? To and now you've got your announcers, the salesmen of your product, obviously cooperating with phony bullshit. Bray Wyatt's the luckiest guy in professional wrestling because he has all these wacky, awful ideas and he's found someone to fund them and put them <laughs> on TV. And it's just terrible stuff. The Firefly Funhouse and all of this shit. Yeah, I'm not looking forward well, to this at all. This is the best thing that could happen to AEW. <laughs> was this guy showing back up on <laughs> WWE TV. If they can get rid of some of their spooky stuff and the House of Blacker and weird uh, limbo based on things they've said, I would love it if they go a different direction, if WWE is going to embrace this shit again. This is terrible. All of a sudden, a magical door appears in the middle of the arena. How did that happen? It's an arena. <laughs> oh, terrible. Uh, Lou Thez would have gone in there with a goddamn handgun. Actually, he wouldn't even have needed it. He'd have gone in there with the fucking Greco-Roman backdrop and the STF, and that would have been that. Anyway, and that's that. And that the is Jim that. Jim Cornette experience. Yeah. Uh, at long last, folks, we'll be back on the drive through That's Brian's program, so you can't blame me. And until then, and in the meantime and in between time, we've had a malfunction at the junction, so for... Ed Whalen and Brian Last and all the people that perpetrate this program. Thank you. Fuck you. Bye-bye, everybody.